love that. I love talking about renewable energy. Sometimes my iPad can be I have to hit it twice or... <laughs> but I have a question for you on, on this. It says much... I need to borrow mine. I got it up here. I think it's okay. I mean, it should come up here. Let's see, because it was red before. Okay, here we go. I love this. Please don't break the microphone. <laughs> well, now I won't. But if you hadn't told me. Good evening. Good evening, friends. Good evening. Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order. Seven o'clock on September the 3rd, 2019. And I certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight, those who are here and also those who are watching our meeting on television. We're Really glad to have you here. And now I would first like to ask you if you could join me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And now I'll ask Councilmember Reese if you could lead us in the Pledge of the Flag. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. Good evening, everyone. If it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise as we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Council Member. And now, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Alston. Here. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Present. Council Member Middleton. Here. Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you very much. We are now going to begin our ceremonial items. And we're going to begin um, with an awesome presentation to some young people who are sitting up here in the front. And I want to ask Councilmember Charlie Reese to join me here, and he's going to do the honors. And I'm going to ask the uh, Sergeant Dante Farrell, the coach, and his team, if they could please come up here for the presentation for the to the South Durham Little League, and I'll. Uh, Welcome them, and I will ask Councilmember Reese to uh, to do the honors. Come on up, guys. Come on up. Come on. And all the other Whereas South Durham Little League is one of only two little leagues in the city of Durham and is a valuable all-volunteer community partner for recreation and youth athletic development in the city of Durham. And whereas South Durham Little League's 7 to 8-year-old Orange All-Star team won the 2019 Little League 7 to 8-year-old District 6 Tournament Championship for the second consecutive season after posting a record of 6 and 0 in tournament play, winning the championship by a score of 14 to 7 at the J. Burt Gillette Athletic Conference complex in Wilson, North Carolina. Whereas with the victory, the team earned a berth in the North Carolina Little League seven to eight-year-old state championship tournament at the J. Burt Gillette Athletic Complex in Wilson, in Wilson, North Carolina, where they posted a record of five and zero, and defeated their final opponent for the North Carolina state championship, championship by a score of eight to four. And whereas the team outscored their district six op tournament opponents 98 to 26, they outscored their state tournament opponents 62 to 12. The team scored 160 runs, recorded 201 hits in 11 games, including 171 singles, 23 doubles, two triples, and five home runs. 
And whereas beginning in June, the team practiced 23 times for a total of 45 hours, sometimes practicing for over three hours at a time. And whereas the team finally cemented themselves as one of the best and most dominant 78 year, seven to eight year old Little League teams in the state of North Carolina for 2019. And whereas collectively this team will long be celebrated for its hard work, athletic excellence, and the enormous sense of pride it brought to Durham and the South Durham Little League community for bringing home South Durham's third Little League state championship banner. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby salute President Jamie Clegg, Coach Dante Farrell and his staff, all the volunteers and members of the 2019 South Durham Little League seven to eight-year-old Orange All-Star team for winning the North Carolina Little League seven to eight-year-old District Six and State Championship tournaments and call upon all citizens to join in saluting these outstanding athletes and the South Durham Little League coaching staff for a job well done. We are confident in a bright future for this program and can't wait until next season. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you, Mayor Shule. Thank you, Council. Thank you, uh, City Manager Bonfield. And uh, to my chief, uh, CJ Davis, thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody taking time to honor these boys. They worked really hard. Um, and we told them from the beginning, if they put the hard work in, they got with the game plan, they, they put it in, then it was going to turn out the way that we expected. And they were good enough. They went out there. They put the best foot forward. They, um, their parents, we had the, the best support and staff. I think that's, that was really the thing that put us over the edge was, was a really great group of parents and a very supportive Little League. I'd um, like to thank Jamie Clegg, our outgoing president, our new president, uh, Philip Holmes. They, they supported us all the way through, and, and as a team, we got together and accomplished our goal. So thank you, everybody. Charlie. Is Chief Davis here? I didn't see the chief. There she is. Chief, one of your finest right here. Congratulations. Uh, now we're going to do a little more baseball. I'm going to ask uh, the 2019 Long Ball RBI Senior All-Star Team and Pat James and any of the members of the team that are here. Pat is the founder and president of Long Ball. If she would come forward and any of her coaches and team members that she would like to bring up. Pat, come on, everybody. Yeah, there's, there's seats up here if anyone would like to take them. I'd like to ask folks to come on in and Sit up front if you don't mind. So, um, Charlie uh, has been known to throw out a little league pitch, and I've been known to throw out a few first pitches myself. And uh, I'm honored to say that I got to throw out the first pitch last year at Long Ball. And uh, how did I do, Pat? Awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> she has to say that because she's up here getting a proclamation. Pat, would you come to the front, please? Whereas Long Ball Durham Triple Play RBI, Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, is a program for 13 to 18-year-old young men and their love of baseball with a focus on the educational, economic, and cultural advancement of Durham. And whereas the Long Ball Senior All-Star Team won the 2019 RBI Mid-Atlantic Regionals, putting Durham on the map in youth baseball 
Thanks to the staff and coaches' continued dedication to these young men of Durham, plus the surrounding cities of Raleigh, Cary, Hillsborough, and as far as Norlina, Henderson, and Charlotte. And whereas with the regionals victory, the long ball senior team earned a bid into the RBI World Series. This is the first time a team from North Carolina has won the Mid-Atlantic Regionals, and long ball is the first North Carolina team to participate in the RBI World Series. And whereas Pat James, where are you, Pat? There. Right here. The president of the program for the past 11 years, and can I add, an amazing force of nature that's not in the proclamation, <laughs> along with her staff and coaches, has done an outstanding job enhancing the program and opening doors for these young men year after year. And whereas the RBI World Series took place in Vero Beach, Florida from August 5th to 9th, where Longball won their debut game and finished seventh in the tournament, and whereas the all-star team consisted of Tyleek Allen, Jaden Bailey, Justin Campbell, Octavius Faison, Clay Faulkner, Taven Johnson, Emery Leak, Angel Maldonado, Malik Powell, Clarence C.J. Robinson III, Josephus Shabazz, Aaron Smith, Gunter Stallings, Dariah Wilburn, and Ki Yamagishi, under the leadership of coaches Frankie Jacobs Sr., Paul Enslin, Larry Yates, and Morris Jones. And whereas collectively, this team will be long celebrated for its excellence, athletic prowess, and the enormous sense of pride it brought to the long ball RBI, fans, and the larger community of Durham and the surrounding cities. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby salute Mrs. Pat James and her staff and members of the 2019 Long Ball Senior All-Star Team for winning the RBI Senior Mid-Atlantic Regional Tournament and call upon all citizens of the City of Durham to join in saluting these outstanding athletes and the Long Ball Athletic staff for a job well done. We are confident in a bright future for this program and can't wait until next season. Congratulations. Thank you all. Long ball wouldn't exist if it weren't for the volunteer staff and coaches of the RBI program. I, saw, I read an article at ESPN that said that youth athletics baseball had participation had increased. What it didn't say was they were talking about the 15U, not the 13-18. At the end of the article, they mentioned the RBI program and having 217 leagues, which leave athletes a place to showcase their talent. It failed to mention that RBI is bridging the gap for those players to ensure they continue to play baseball, minus the expenses. There are players on our team who got coach cut from their school teams, players from our, on this team that's not even in their starting lineup, but they can go back to school with a smile on their face because regional champ saves it all. For this reason, it is needed, RBI is needed and should be supported as it continues to be baseball's favorite pastime. We made history by being the first North Carolina RBI program to host the Mid-Atlantic Regionals in 30 years. We are a three-month summer program competing against teams that play year-round with major league sponsors, indoor facilities, and yet we were playing with the best of them. The regional economic impact to Durham was $4,970,462, yet our local news media didn't think it was newsworthy. The last six years, Long Ball has had 100% of our high school graduates continuing their education at two- and four-year colleges. Young men making an impact on the field and off the field should always be newsworthy. We also give scholarships to our seniors along with a and help, Long Ball staff coaches and volunteers, minor league baseball, Durham Bulls, Durham Sports Commission, Durham Public Schools, Durham Parks and Rec, North Carolina Central University and Duke baseball programs, Major League Baseball RBI program, Discover Durham, and other volunteers and workers were all a part of the steering committee that aided the success of the regionals this year. I am glad to announce that Lone Ball has been asked to host the regionals again in 2020. Over 600 people will be traveling back to Durham July 16th through the 19th, 2020, and this time we would like for all Durham to be there as well. A special thanks to my staff and coaches for the many years of continued volunteerism to Long Ball. We're gonna win it again. <laughs>
Pat says that she, when she was reading the, the uh, her statement, she made a mistake. The amount of money brought in was four hundred and ninety-seven thousand oh, wow. dollars. That's good. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask Councilmember Deidreana Freeman if she would please join me uh, at the podium for the proclamation for National Recovery Month, and I'm going to ask Robert Thomas, Chair of the Recovery Community of Durham, if he would uh, please join me here at the podium with anyone else that uh, he would like to bring up. Mr. Thomas, nice to see you all. Councilmember Freeman. So in recognition of the National Recovery Month, all the many years of service you provided. I, I think it's, it's well deserved. Whereas behavioral health is now recognized as an essential part of one's overall health and well-being, and whereas the cost of not encourage, encouraging mental health and substance use recovery is significant for individuals, families, and neighborhoods, and the community at large, and whereas people in recovery strive to achieve healthy lifestyles, stable homes, meaningful daily activities, stronger neighborhoods, and contribute in positive ways to the larger community. And whereas the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, reports that drug overdo over overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death for adults under age 55 in the U.S., with over 72,000 lethal drug overdoses in 2017. And whereas SAMHSA reports that and in any given, I'm sorry, S-A-M-H-S-A, -A -A, sorry, reports that in any given year, 20% of us will experience a mental health issue, but only 44% of adults and 38% of youth will receive appropriate mental health treatment. Given these statistics, we must strive to reduce the stigma, shame, and negative stereotypes associated with brain disorders and help individuals, families, and larger community, in the larger community learn to view them as we would any other medical condition. And whereas, to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, HHS, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, I'm not going to say that one, and the Recovery Community of Durham, RCOD, invite all residents of Durham County North Carolina to participate in the National Recovery Month. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 2019 as National Recovery Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to observe this month with appropriate programs, activities, ceremonies, and to support this year's recovery theme, join the voices for recovery. Together, we are stronger. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank the mayor and the city council members for that proclamation and uh, also their consistent and ongoing support for health, wellness, and recovery here in Durham. My name is Bob Thomas. I'm the chair of the Recovery Community of Durham. We are a nonprofit that works to promote recovery from mental health and substance use disorders. We're essentially a group of volunteers. And one of the ways we do that, promote recovery, is to hold community events so we are hosting uh, a recovery event uh, in support of SAMHSA's de designation of September's National Recovery Month on September 14th at Durham Central Park from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, that's a Saturday, so I know you can all make it. Uh, we um, will have live music, two live music acts. We'll have line dancing. We'll have health screenings. We'll have inspiring speakers. We have children's activities. It's really a family event. And we really want it to be thought of as a celebration because we really do need to celebrate the fact that despite all the stigma and negative stereotypes, people do recover from mental health and substance use disorders here in Durham. And we need to acknowledge that and as a community support that. As the uh, proclamation said, we really need to look at these brain disorders simply as another medical condition 
No different from any other chronic health problem, such as diabetes or hypertension, and support people moving into treatment. And early is much better. Let's put it that way. Um, many times, when it comes to uh, brain disorders, family and friends are the ones that notice the changes in people first. And if they can intervene and start to move those people into treatment, let's just say that, as I said before, earlier is better because why is very clear is that if, if people move into treatment early, that means they still probably have some family support, they haven't burnt all their bridges, they still have employment possibilities, they haven't developed a criminal record. In other words, there's a lot of supports that they can build on. So let's try to work on making people not shamed, not stigmatized, or recognize that they have a medical condition for which there are medical treatments, and to treat it no different than we would any other chronic health problem. Now I know in um, 2017, we've been dealing with a little bit of a different issue in terms of this uh, fentanyl. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about fentanyl and the use of it. Uh, and for someone who's worked in behavioral health for 45 years, this is really a different kind of an animal. I mean, we've seen drugs come and go, heroin, powder cocaine, crack cocaine, but fentanyl is a whole different, I mean, they measure it in milligrams, and only two or three milligrams of this drug will cause an overdose. 70% of the overdoses in 2017 were the result of fentanyl mixed with some other type of drug. And that means that drug overdoses for all classes of drugs rose in 2017. Even for drugs like tranquilizers, deaths due to the overdose with fentanyl also rose. So we're talking about 72,237 deaths in 2017. That's about 200 people a day dying from uh, an opioid fentanyl drug combination, over 70% were related to fentanyl. But to put that in perspective, um, where is it? 480,000 people in 2017 died due to tobacco-related uh, illnesses, and 88,000 died due to alcohol-related illnesses. So, you know, we have a drug problem. And the sooner we acknowledge that and get people out in the open and into treatment, the better off we'll be. This fentanyl thing is scary. The CDC says that for 2018, they're predicting 68,000 deaths, which would be about a 5% decrease. So we don't know if 2017 was the peak, if it's going to go lower. But we know it's a problem that everybody in the community should be aware of and should deal with or help deal with. Um, U, uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services also reports that um, suicides are also on the, on the uh, increase. So we live in a very divisive time, but I think recovery is something we can all come together to support. And so I'm hoping you'll come out and support uh, our event on September 14th, Durham Central Park, 2 to 6 p.m. Everyone's welcome. I'd like Randy to say just a couple of quick remarks as a voice uh, of recovery. Thank you, Bob. Hi, I'm Randy Tucker, and I'm a person that is in long-term recovery. And the recovery community of Durham is all about, there's many pathways to recovery. Uh, recovery for me means that I have not seen a need to go return to drug use. I've, I've been a parent to my children. I've been a son to my parents. Uh, I've been a part of the community. And I've been a Durham County employee for 29 years. And I'm an employee that is also a substance use counselor. So not only did I get a a, a new life. I get, got an opportunity to also provide service to people around me. And Recovery Community of Durham is just another group that there's no wrong door for recovery. Um,
Come out to the event, bring the kids, bring friends. It's all about celebrating that people do recover. Thank you. We have one last uh, celebratory item tonight, and I'm going to ask our public historian, Eddie Davis, to come forward for a presentation. As you all may know, this is our uh, sesquicentennial year, and uh, I'd say monthly or so, we have uh, historical pres historic, pres historic presentations here at the Durham City Council member that uh, we are so glad that Eddie has been leading us in over this last year. And we are now going to... Uh, have a presentation about Durham murals, and uh, Emily Eve Weinstein is here as well. So, uh, Eddie, take it away. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good afternoon, uh, evening to the council and the staff. Uh, the arrival of September and yesterday's commemoration of Labor Day reminds us of the pending seasonal change. We also are reminded of the colorful annual program we know as Centerfest. Uh, as residents and visitors participate in Cinefest, watch football games, and attend concerts, we hope that their eyes will be attracted to the many murals that are creatively and artistically depicted on the walls of buildings across our wonderful community. Um, with the assistance of our, our AV department, uh, we're going to have se several of those murals that are um, some of my favorites. Um, displayed for you. Um, okay, here they come. Okay. There are some that you probably recognize from different parts of the city. Um, that's one of several Pauli Murray. There's another Pauli Murray. That one is on Buchanan. Another Pauli Murray that is on Carroll Street where she used to live. And another Pauli Murray that is on Foster Street. That's at Community Montessori, which is in the Lakewood Shopping Center, Southern Boundaries, which is a facility that is operated in the Durham Parks and Recreation. The famous Duke, sometimes called Graffiti Wall, that changes every single time we look around. There's the John Avery Boys Club mural. Uh, Emily Weinstein's mural that depicts the 50th anniversary of, of, the, um, of Durham Tech, another Emily Weinstein, another Emily Weinstein. Both of these last two have come under some scrutiny uh, and needed a needed repair. That one's called Bull City. Uh, that one's called Angel of Spring. Here comes the sun. It's on Main Street. That's been there since 1975. Uh, Two-way bridges that celebrates the um, cooperation of, of the Hispanic community and, of course, the civil rights mural. Uh, if you like blues music or jazz music, see that one at the Blue Note Grill. And, of course, um, um, that is Angel of Hope. So those murals are some of the many that we have here, and uh, uh, many of them are the work of Emily Weinstein. We will now hear about three minutes uh, of remarks from the renowned muralist uh, Emily Eve Weinstein about her work, and Ms. Weinstein will be followed by three-minute remarks by Dr. Bill Ingram, the president of Durham Tech. Dr. Ingram will talk a bit about the importance of the intermingling history of Durham and our prestigious community college. Emily? I'm not as tall as you. Um, hi. Uh, gosh, I have a lousy memory, so I'm just going to read, right? I thought I was coming after you. So anyway, um, I uh, landed here in Durham in 1982. After three years of living on the road as an itinerant artist, I moved to Durham. Uh, I've been working as a career painter, doing murals, portraiture, fine art for over 40 years now. The Eno River mural was possibly the most complex with over 800 native species of flora and fauna. 
and took six months to create. But also, at Durham Tech, I was hired by the student body to create a mural about higher education. The work was very collaborative in nature <laughs> and kept on changing. Um, I had many excellent volunteers. Volunteers are very often the root of what I do when it comes to murals. Um, I, I did my first mural at age 22, but it wasn't until 20 years later that I discovered how important it is to include children in the production of public art. When I've been doing murals, kids as young as seven have come around my scaffolding to see what I'm up to. They were always unsupervised, and I viewed them as untapped labor. <laughs> I put a brush in their hands and put them to work. After all, kids absolutely love to paint. If there are any adults around that are volunteering, I pair them up with a child. We get a lot more work done that way. After creating the Hay Time mural, I overheard a group of kids talking with pride about their participation in it. To grow into a contributing citizen, we all need to be a part of something larger than ourselves. Public art offers an incredible opportunity to engage the public, particularly youth, to identify with their community and recognize that they are very valuable. So I implore you to always choose artists that bring children into the mix so that they can be part of our community and grow up strong. You can see my artwork here in Durham at Bull City Art and Frame Shop on Main Street and also at Seeley's Studio on Foster Street right next to the Farmer's Market. Uh, there are invitations if you're interested in coming by my art studio and learning what I'm working on right now. I'm working on a 25-year project. I'll be 80 when it's finished. Uh, don't ask me how old I am. Oh, God. Well, in any case, I'm on the 10th year. OK, so now you know. Uh, but I'm working on this project. You are all invited. And I have invitations up here with the city clerks. Um, yeah. And uh, also, my books can be gotten. I have four published books, and I'm working on this project uh, in which I uh, publish a book a year for 25 years. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, my website is emilyeveweinstein.com. And uh, do stop by my open studio. You're all invited. It's a lot of fun. There'll be about 80 studios open on, that week, on the first two weekends of November. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Eddie. And I <clears throat> invite you to uh, come to Durham Tech and see the uh, 50th anniversary mural that Emily and our students uh, created uh, to celebrate our 50th anniversary. In 1957, the North Carolina General Assembly authorized a small appropriation to establish a network of regional industrial education centers. At that time, Durham had already had, already had a vigorous program in adult education through the Vocational and Adult Education Department of the Durham City Schools. A practical nursing program had been established in 1948, and other programs included training in mechanical and architectural drafting and electronics technology. Literacy skills, training, and courses in a variety of trades were also offered to build an adult's educational foundation and upgrade a worker's skills. And thanks to the uh, actions of the Durham City Board of Education, Durham was among the first of six counties in North Carolina to qualify for funding. And through a successful render referendum in June of 1958, Durham County residents made $500,000 available to pur purchase a site and erect the first building of the Durham Industrial Education Center. This center was always envisioned as an institution that would serve all of Durham's residents. When the center opened its doors, a racially integrated class of 34 students entered to study mechanical engineering, distribution and marketing, automotive mechanics, and dental laboratory technology. When the Board of Trustees for the Durham Industrial Education Center was appointed and met for the first time, both the school and the board were integrated, ensuring a representative voice for the, for the community being served. Today, nearly 60 years later, Durham Technical Community College remains committed 
for our founders' vision of service to over 18,000 students. As a comprehensive community college, Durham Tech awards high school equivalency credentials to over 200 adults each year. We help prepare community's firefighters, emergency medical responders, and law enforcement officers. As the community college for the city of medicine, Durham Tech prepares local residents for important careers in nursing, respiratory therapy, surgical technology, and clinical trials. And over 4,000 employees of our community's largest employer, Duke Health System, list Durham Tech on their resumes as a place they received education and training. Durham Tech's information technology program <clears throat> prepare residents for a range of careers, computer programming, web design and development, and network support and security. Each year, hundreds of Durham Tech students transfer to North Carolina Central University, North Carolina State, UNC Chapel Hill, and dozens of other prestigious four-year colleges and universities where they study, where they pursue bachelor's degrees in everything from accounting to welding to world history. And dozens of local businesses and industries turn to Durham Tech to prepare their workforce in pharma pharmaceutical research and production, advanced manufacturing, and logistics. Today, Durham Tech exists at the intersection of two of our community's most critical issues. Employers turn to us for talent so they can continue to build in the robust economy that many of us in this room benefit from tonight. Meanwhile, residents of Dur see Durham Tech as a road to economic opportunity and mobility, preparing them to move from $8 an hour job to an $18,000 a year job to an $80,000 a year career. Community is the most important word in our title. It represents both the community that we are and the community that we are part of. Great communities are both comprised of and served by great institutions, and Durham Tech aspires to be the community college that Durham both deserves and demands. Durham Tech is here to help reinvent our communities and the people who, com who comprise them. We are proud to be the community college of the city of Madison, the, the community college of the Search Triangle Park, and Northeast Central Durham, and Woodcroft, and Trinity Park, and Old Farm, and Haytai, and Bahama, and Bethesda, and Parkwood. We are proud to be Durham's community college. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for that historic, historic or history moment, and to Ms. Weinstein, and to President Ingram, we are glad you were here. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being present for our celebratory items. They were a little longer than usual tonight, but they were good ones, and uh, I'm really glad we were able to do them. And now I'll ask, are there any announcements by members of the council? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, given that we are expecting a hurricane, uh, Hurricane Dorian, to um, approach the North Carolina coast later this week, I was hoping we could get a report from our um, emergency management director about the plans that they have um, for helping us cope with this hurricane and also for any assistance that we um, might be able to or expected to provide to folks who might um, come to Durham from the coast uh, as those areas might experience some more significant impacts. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mr. Manager, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members. Hi, my name is Jim Groves and I am the City County Emergency Management Director. I'd like to give you a quick brief on, on, on our preparedness efforts for the storm coming in, but also how we're preparing to take care of those from out of state and at our coast that uh, might come into Durham to stay, uh, stay supported shelter. Um, I think first of all, we've learned a lot of lessons from what happened in Raleigh and in uh, Orange County with the Friday Center last year with the uh, large shelter opening. Uh, so we have been trying to use best practices and lessons learned uh, to prevent maybe some of the issues from happening uh, here in, in the city of Durham and up at uh, Northgate Mall at Sears. So uh, we've been in constant communication with the state uh, emergency management and any state resource that has been mobilized towards Durham County, and I'll go over those in just a minute, to make sure we understand that 
um, uh, the, the biggest thing that we're trying to prevent is an overload on our community resources to make sure that uh, the people are taken care of, but we're also still able to take care of our community. So uh, the actions that I'm gonna talk uh, to you have been uh, kind of performed in that light. Um, we have uh, conducted uh, numerous conference calls, webinars with our city and county department directors already, uh, our shelter staff operators, uh, any support mechanism that we'll use. So if we have to open up our own shelter separate from this one, we'll be able to do that and carry on. Um, we've also been uh, talking uh, with all of our emergency services agencies to make sure that we have uh, a good plan and contingencies uh, in place for that. Uh, for the statewide shelter, Sandy Bridges, which works with the emergency management, uh, she has been designated as a shelter incident commander. The state actually reached out and asked if our staff would, would run the shelter for them. So we've gone through de uh, declarations of uh, uh, authority with them to make sure that uh, uh, we're well covered from liabilities as is Sandy. Um, but she'll be working with an incident management team from Winston-Salem Forsyth. That's kind of an overhead planning team. Uh, and she'll also be working with the Red Cross, uh, Salvation Army, um, and other folks that will come and be supporting the, the, uh, the shelter. The shelter is pet, pet friendly. So uh, the Department of Agriculture, the State Department of Agriculture, uh, has several animals, uh, animal, excuse me, animal uh, support teams, cast teams, uh, that are available, and also companion animal equipment trailers, CAMETs, to make sure that the animals that come down are safe and well taken care of and a way to, to feed them. Uh, the, the American Red Cross will be providing shelter registration and feeding. Uh, security at the shelter is going to be provided by the State Department of Corrections, but we've uh, been working with the Durham Police Department to make sure we have contingency plans uh, if that does not appear like it's the best option. But right now, um, uh, State Department of Corrections will be doing this shelter security um, with DPD making a presence every hour going inside the shelter and actually showing a presence there. Um, medical needs at the shelter will be provided by a five ambulance uh, strike team. That, uh, that strike team comes out of the Charlotte area and they will be self-sustaining. Under the state of emergency, they can provide paramedicine and so they'll be taking care of any acute need that's at the shelter and they will be able to transfer from the shelter to our local area hospitals. Durham County EMS is on the hook for standby, but right now we don't anticipate using any of our local county resources uh, for any medical transport. Um, in addition to the five county ambulance strike team, uh, we'll have nurses, physicians, and pharmacists to make sure that we can take care of any other medical needs and prescription needs if they arise while folks are there. Uh, sanitary needs are gonna be handled uh, mostly by external traders. So there's a lot of traders out there at the mall. Uh, those are gonna be uh, accessible, uh, but they, uh, the majority of sanitary needs will be handled out there. Inside, to inside toilets will also be available. The state has a contract to make sure those are cleaned and stocked well. Um, we have uh, been working with the state to make sure that the solid waste contract uh, is gonna be taken care of, that we do not have trash left behind or the mall left in a mess or the area in a mess, although we have not been notified that contract has been signed. A special medical needs shelter is gonna be opening up in Clayton, North Carolina. So when people are leaving the coast, they'll be asked to go to Clayton if they have a special medical need uh, with their provider. So with all that, uh, we've deactivated our emergency operations center this evening. We'll, we'll go back into operations about 6.30 in the morning, and we're gonna plan on going 24 seven until Dorian um, no longer poses a threat to us. Thank you very much, Mr. Groves, so appreciate it. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for that report. It's very comprehensive. Um, and your department and your staff always do a great job making sure that we're prepared and that we're able to take care of people who might need help coming from other areas. And we all really appreciate all the work that you do. It makes me feel a lot safer. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. Just specifically around um, medical needs for folks who might be on dial dialysis and specific like conditions. How would you attend to that as well? Correct, so part of the nurses and physicians assistants and folks that will be at this shelter, uh, their job is to coordinate with people who depend on dialysis and to schedule that with our local uh, companies that do that. And the five, uh, the five ambulances will be used to transport those people back and forth uh, if another means cannot be uh, found. Thank you, Mr. Groves. We very much appreciate Thank your you work. Appreciate Thank you so much, yeah. really appreciate it. Uh, now we'll move uh, to priority items by the city manager. Uh, Mr. Manager, any priority items? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. 
Madam Attorney. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Glad to have our Senior Deputy City Attorney, Sherry Zan Rosenthal, joining us tonight. Uh, and Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I have no items. Thank you so much. All right, now we'll move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda uh, consists of items that the Council has previously worked on, and it can be approved by a single vote of the Council. Any Council member or member of the public can pull an item from the consent agenda, and if an item is pulled, uh, we deal with it uh, at the end of the meeting. So I'll now read the consent agenda. Thank you. All right. Uh, item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham Convention Center Authority appointment. Item three, Recreation Advisory Commission appointment. Item four, boards, committees, and commissions attendance reports. Item five, appointments to civilian police review board. Item six, 2020 city council meeting schedule. Item seven, city of Durham, go Durham transit advertising policy. Item eight, U4726HO Carpenter Fletcher Road Sidewalk and Bike Lane Municipal Agreement. Item 9, U4726HN Hillendale Road Sidewalk and Bike Lane Municipal Agreement. Item 10, Bid Report. Item 11, Acceptance of 2019 National League of Cities Leadership and Community Resilience Program Grant. Item 12, Design Services with Vines Architecture Inc. for the Weaver Street and WD Hill Recreation Center Renovations Project. Uh, this item was pulled uh, by Mrs. Victoria Peterson. <laughs> item 13, Durham 150 grant to support an event that promotes awareness of the 2020 census and honors the city's sesquicentennial. Item 14, intergovernmental agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey for operation and maintenance of the city of Durham rainfall and streamflow network. Item 15, contract SW67 sidewalk repairs 2019, <clears throat> also pulled by Ms. Peterson. Uh, those are the items on the consent agenda, and with the exception of items 12 and 15, can I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move to our general business agenda. And we'll begin with item 16, the 2019 second quarter crime report. And I will welcome Chief Davis and her staff. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chief. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the Durham Police Department's second quarter report. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank my staff for being here, the exec team and other uh, employees who work with me daily to make sure that we provide the highest uh, service delivery possible to our citizens, so I thank them for their support. Tonight, this report covers our department's five performance measures, part one, violent crime, Part one, property crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, staffing levels, and following my crime report, we will also have a report by Jason Sheese, our analytical services manager on traffic stop data. So part one, violent crime includes homicides, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults. Part one, violent crime was up 16% during the first six months of 2019 compared to the same period in 2018. It is currently up by 7%, so we've made some improvement to that percentage point. There were 21 criminal homicides in the first two quarters of 2019 compared to 14 in the first two quarters of 2018. During the first six months of 2019, there were also three additional fatal shootings that have been ruled as self-defense, and one case classified as negligent manslaughter. Arrests have been made in 14 cases, and warrants have been issued in one additional case. One case involving two victims was classified as a domestic violence case. 
Investigators have also cleared four cases from 2018 and one from 2016 homicides. The number of reported sexual assaults during the first six months of 2019 was the same as the reported period during the same time in 2018. The number didn't shift, 57, 2018, 57, and 2019. Robberies occurred by 7% during the first, oh, excuse me, robberies increased by 7% during the first six months of 2019 compared to the same period in 2018. 86% of robberies were from persons. During the second quarter, we continued to experience a trend of robberies from Hispanic victims, particularly in apartment complexes. 44% of the robberies from persons involved Hispanic victims. Uh, to combat this, this particular trend, we increased our patrols in those affected areas where these crimes were, were occurring most and met with residents in several of these complexes. Officers passed out crime prevention information flyers in English and in Spanish and provided information and tips to local media. Our Hispanic liaison coordinated successful forums at Hispanic churches and other locations and we plan to continue these type meetings in order to continue to pass on information to our community members and build relationships. Our Hispanic liaison officer also participates in a monthly Hispanic radio show and provides crime prevention information during those opportunities as well. The percentage of robberies improved during the third quarter of this year, 28% so far in the third quarter as opposed to the 44% increase in the second quarter. Robberies as a whole are down by 2% year to date. There were 41 commercial robberies, which included seven bank robberies. One person has been charged with four different bank robberies in the city of Durham. Two thirds, about 67% of all robberies involved firearms and 15 people were injured in the commission of robberies in the city of Durham. 31% of all aggravated assaults during the first two quarters were from multi-victim firearm incidents versus 34% during the first six months of 2018. Our target for this particular uh, category is 30%. 28% of all aggravated assault cases were domestic violence related. The number of shooting incidents rose by 35% from 231 during the first six months of 2018 to 312 in 2019. The number of shooting victims increased by 19% from 68 in 2018 to 81 in 2019. There have been an estimated 36 additional non-domestic violence assault by pointing a weapon cases in 2019 compared to last year during the same period. There have been a total of 415 illegal weapons confiscated by the Durham Police Department year to date. 185 individuals have been arrested on gun charges while in the commission of a crime year to date. Either the weapon was used to commit the crime, illegally possessed, stolen, or in the possession of a felon. Moving on to part one, property crime. Part one property crime includes burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. Part one property crime makes up 84% of all part one crime. Part one property crime was up by 10% at the end of the second quarter. It was up by 3% at the end of August. So we made some improvements there as well. Burglaries were at a 10-year low for the first six months of the year. We have recently seen an increase in break-ins to sheds and construction sites where materials are left uh, out in the open. We continue to post information about these um, particular types of situations to next door and on other so social media platforms. Our part one property crimes 
was driven mostly by a 23% rise in larcenies, which make up almost two thirds, 63% of uh, part one crime. 43% of larcenies were from motor vehicles. <clears throat> During the second quarter, we noticed a significant increase in larcenies of catalytic converters. And you may have heard some of the news um, um, announcements that, that um, some of our local stations have helped us with so that we can get the word out to our churches and other companies that have vans that typically have these catalytic converters that are, are being targeted. Um, we've distributed crime alerts along with uh, other crime prevention tips to our churches through various media sources. Officers from our community services division reached out to, to the local churches um, in person and also uh, sending out information via mail, ways to help prevent these thefts. Part one, clearance rates. We compare our department's clearance rates to those of other departments our size. We are in the FBI's 250,000 to 499, 499,000, almost 500,000 population range. Our clearance rates were better than the average for cities our size in all property crime categories and homicide and robberies during the first two quarters of 2019. Note on the rape clearances, approximately 35% of the cases of rape were from prior years. Also, rape cases often require tests such as DNA, and these results typically take some time to get back, so we expect our clearance rates to improve as the results from various types of tests come back. We were recognized this year, earlier this year, uh, by the North Carolina Attorney General, Josh Stein, for our expeditious clearing of backlog cases, sexual assault cases, which a lot of cities in the state of North Carolina have struggled with. Um, I believe now we are number one as far as clearing up those backlogs. Priority one calls for service. There were 3,954 priority one calls for service in the first half of 2019 which was a 10.5% decrease from 4,420 priority one calls during the same period in 2018. Our average response time was 5.8 minutes, which met our target of 5.8 minutes or less. This was a significant improvement over the 6.12 minute average during the first two quarters. And we, over the several months, we've kind of hovered at that six minute range. So we did meet that particular target. We answered 54.9% of priority one calls in less than five minutes in the first two quarters of 2019. This was an improvement over the 51.3% during the first two quarters of 2018. We continue to use our overtime funding to pay for supplemental patrols, which increases our ability to respond quickly to emergency calls. We have adjusted supplemental staffing in order to ensure officers are on the road during peak times when we need them most. Um, these um, improved conditions are predicated on officer volunteerism. However, we continue to try to utilize overtime to fill gaps. Our staffing levels, our sworn staffing was at 96% at the end of June 2019. It is now at 98%, which includes BLET number 50. Our non-sworn staffing was at 97% at the end of June. 20 recruits will be graduating from BLET number 49 on September 18th, this um, in, in another uh, week or so. We currently have 28 recruits in our Basic Law Enforcement Training Academy number 50, which started today. We have hired two ALET lateral recruits and plan to screen a few more. Um, these are the individuals who are already state certified that uh, come on to our department that do not have to take the entire 
uh, training uh, curriculum. We're looking at several other um, recruits at this particular time, and we will continue uh, our recruiting to um, to match our attrition rate, or at least to fight our attrition rate. As for U visas, the Durham Police Department processed 59 U visa requests during the second quarter of 2019. 76% were approved. In an effort to assist the investigation and successful prosecution of certain crimes, the Durham Police Department will review applications for U non-immigration status. By reviewing and certifying applications, the department seeks to secure the assistance and testimony of crime victims who may otherwise become unavailable due to their immigration status. As you can see, there are significant improvements as it relates to the U visa approvals. Some highlights over the last few months, the Durham Police Department held its annual service awards this ceremony was in May, of, uh, uh, May 23rd, 2019. Awards were presented to Durham Police Department employees as well as citizens who went out of their way to assist officers in the commission of their duties. This photo is, um, is of the members of our Property and Evidence Unit who won the first time ever Unit of the Year Award. You can read more about the award winners in our accompanying second quarter written report. <clears throat> The Durham Police Department's employees were also involved in numerous community events and outreach activities during the second quarter. These are just a few examples of the many um, events that they attended. District 3 held a meet and greet at the Garrett Apartments on April 16th. DPD employees joined with employees from numerous other city departments to meet residents and provide information and resources. It was one of several meet and greets held in the District 3 area to try to, pro to provide information for community members, especially as we were experiencing upticks in certain types of crimes. On April 24th, officers were from Squad 4B passed out Easter eggs to children at a local park and enjoyed getting to meet the children and their parents. The Durham Police Department employees attended the Durham County Special Olympics as well, which is a, an event that we take part in every year. Uh, they helped out with the event and cheered on our Special Olympics athletes. We held our first of three week long sessions of the Durham Police Department Summer Camp on June 17th through the 21st. We have three different sessions during the summer. 30 children ages 9 to 13 attended the camp, which was coordinated and hosted by the Durham Police Department Community Services Division. The camps aimed to, to add structure and act youth activities to summer months and to strengthen law enforcement's relationship with participating youth and their families. Campers take daily field trips and participate in recreational, educational, educational and social activities with police officers and other campers. These experiences are both educational and they build bonds between our officers and the community at large. On May 18th, officers from the Durham Police Department Selective Enforcement Team helped make eight-year-old, make sure I try to get this name right, Asel Pimentel Gutierrez, wishes come true during a make-a-wish party for him at UNC Hospital. Asel loves the police, so the set officers brought one of their specialized equipment vehicles for him to see and presented him with a certificate, making him an honorary DPD officer for the day. The Durham Police Department officers were joined by officers from the UNC Hospital Police as well. These are just a few of the community activities that our officers participated in during this particular uh, quarter. And that concludes my report. Um, and is your wish to hear the traffic report next or ask questions now? I think what I would prefer, uh, Chief, is to go ahead and any questions for you and then we'll go to uh, Mr. Shees for the traffic uh, report. Thank you. Yes. Let me just say that we have, the Chief has listed uh, in her report uh, some of the honors that people have won and some of the community efforts. Uh, this is the first time that we've had 
another one of our officers in the in the building uh, since she received a signal honor. Uh, Chief Davis uh, was inaugurated a couple of weeks ago, Chief. Yes. Down in New Orleans as the national president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. And we are incredibly <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. This thank is a you. signal honor for Durham and a tremendous achievement. And uh, it was obvious uh, to myself and City Manager Tom Bonfield, Council Member Freeman, Council Member Middleton, and many of the other uh, your your uh, leadership team, uh, and I think there were probably 25 people from Durham, officers and others who were down there to support you, and uh, yeah, the chief was inaugurated in a room of, I would say, 2,000 people. It was yes. a giant yes. crowd of support, and uh, you are held uh, in incredibly high esteem, and we are lucky to have you. Thank you. So, Thank you for your support. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, all right, I'm going to now uh, ask council members for questions, uh, comments. Uh, I'll start with council member Freeman. I, I just had a couple questions specific to the, I think it was, hold on. The slide where you're listing out the crimes that have occurred. I just wanted to know specifically around rape, if minors were included or if, there was, if it was segregated at, out in any way, shape or form that showed numbers Actually, um, we don't we don't take the numbers out if there is an incident. Uh, I do know during this particular period we didn't have an incident of a minor being involved in a rape allegation. Uh, however, in the numbers themselves, but we do protect the identity of those victims. And I was just noting that that clearance rate is really low, and I recognize that it's low across the state, but. If there's any way that we could work on that, I would love to have that conversation. Absolutely. And I also wanted to um, commend you on clearing up the backlog. So I understand that it's been still working on that. Yeah. A lot of collaboration with the state on the in their labs on that. And I don't know if you um, if it's I know it's the average that's shared in response time, but do you know what the longest response time is and the shortest for this particular period? Yeah. Um, it could range because we have some some areas in the city that if they get a call, it could be 10 minutes. However, uh, during this particular period, and, and of course, if that happens, that number could sort of shift, you know, the overall numbers as well. But uh, we have worked on response times by utilizing supplemental officers and also dividing beats up so that we have more than just one officer responding to large geographical areas. So I can get you the information for this particular period, but I've seen response times in some of our beats up to 11 minutes. Um, and fortunately, not priority one calls, because priority one calls, we typically try to you know, get to them in a very expeditious manner. But uh, I can, we have that information broken down too. I just wanted to verify that there was, there was someone that mentioned a 45 minute wait and I was just like, that's impossible. So I just, just trying to verify. Thank yeah. You. Council, could you pull the microphone just a little closer to you? Please? I'm sorry. I was just trying to make sure, I had heard that there was an incident where it was a 45 minute wait and I just wanted to verify that that was not the case. Well, and it depends 11. on, too, when the call is dispatched. Okay. So when the officer re receives the call, it could have been in a holding pattern, depending on the priority of it, and the priority is set by the dispatchers. So if it's not a high priority, then if it's a very busy night, we have many priority one calls where people are, you know, are really needing the police for a very serious types of, doesn't mean we're not coming, but it, it means that you might end up waiting a little bit longer, especially for um, crimes where there isn't a suspect on the scene or a theft or something of that nature. But we can always check in, too, if you have that person's information. Okay. Any further questions, Council Member? No, that's it. All right, thank you. Uh, I've, I've called on Council Member Austin and then uh, Council Member Reese and then Mayor Pro Tem. 
Thank you. Uh, I'll be quick. Thank you for your report, Chief, and I appreciate the questions by my colleague about response times. And I just simply wanted to uh, congratulate you on kind of reaching your target for response times. I know in the short time I've been on council, I think this is the first time, but I think you've reported that you've hit your target. And I know a tremendous I think amount in of work. three years, this is the first time I've reported it. <laughs> um, I just know a tremendous amount of work has gone into to, to hitting that number. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I think I said Council Member Reese, then uh, Mayor Pro Tem, then Council Member Middleton. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Chief. How's it going? I'm good. Thank you. I wanted to uh, highlight some of the progress that your department has made over the last six months around domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you look at the trends uh, year to date, 2017, year to date, 2018, year to date, 2019, it's really remarkable the amount of progress that you've made. And I just wanted to say, make sure that folks know that a big part of the progress that's been made this year, especially in the last quarter, this is the first full quarter, I believe, that your officers have been equipped with the new lethality assessment program yes. uh, that, you've put, that you've put together in cooperation with the uh, Durham Crisis Response Center uh, and a group of, an interdisciplinary group of professionals who work with victims uh, called, called the Family Justice Center. Yeah. Um, that uh, new program has really been phenomenally well received, yeah. uh, both amongst the advocates, but also by your officers, and they have yes. really taken it to heart um, and are using that new program uh, to really make a difference in the lives of the victims of domestic violence. Um, as you may know, that was one of the things that I've worked on in my uh, three or four careers ago. Um, and uh, it's just really, uh, really amazing to see that progress and how great that partnership has become. Um, I just wanted to also thank you for sending one of your officers from the domestic violence unit uh, with a group of folks to uh, Guilford County uh, last week. Uh, to visit their uh, Family Justice Center. Mm -hmm. That's a really uh, tra transformational facility that they've put together in Guilford County. I look forward to working with you and our county commissioners to try to make something similar happen in the city of Durham. So, Well, just, I believe in the lethality assessment program. Uh, I know it's sort of new for us, but it works. Uh, it helps our officers for individuals that aren't familiar with lethality assessment. It helps officers to recognize potential um, domestic violence um, indicators on just a, a normal call and not to ignore what those indicators are because they could potentially save lives if, if you have intervention involved. So and The folks at the Durham Crisis Response Center have just been glowing about how um, patrol officers are really taking that initiative um, and really identifying those factors. And so I just wanted to say again, thank you. I know this is something you've been personally involved in and wanted to make sure got implemented well, and uh, it's been phenomenal. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief, for your report. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about the misdemeanor diversion program. I was really excited to see that um, this quarter you've expanded the program um, to older adults and just wanted um, to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that work and your experience with it. So, of course, it's still fresh, uh, but the, the same policy applies. We just changed the age range to 25. The officers are aware that um, an individual who has not been in the criminal justice system uh, before, um, that this is a first offense up to the age 25, can be um, referred to our misdemeanor diversion program. So uh, we haven't gotten to a point where we have gotten all of the numbers together as it relates to that particular group, but we'll be monitoring that so that we can um, report to see how many individuals were outside of that 21 range going into the 25 window that actually took advantage of, of that program. Yeah. In the report, it says that there were four people over 26 <laughs> were also included. Is that kind of just the um, like a judgment call by the officers if there is an older person with the first offense that they could choose to put them in the program as well? Well, after 25, officers still have the discretion just based on the type of scenario. If okay. they feel like this is a person that could benefit from this particular program, they can do that. Okay. They can do that if the person is 50. Okay. And it's a first offense because the court systems have um, made it clear to us that, that if we recommend them based on the scenario, that they will receive them under that same program. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, just want to, again, commend you and your officers for making use of this program. I think it's 
a really valuable service for our residents, and we want to make sure that you know we continue to use it to um, to its greatest utility. That folks who are committing their first offense, who could be helped with these sorts of mental health services, substance use, employment assistance, um, rather than entering the criminal justice system, that that's a win for all of us. So thank you for um, for focusing on that work, and um, we really appreciate the work that you do to make that possible. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Good evening, Chief. And good evening. Man, staff, always good to see all of you. Uh, Chief, I think this is your first time appearing before us since you assumed the presidency of Noble. So <laughs> congratulations is. again. You. If you hear any reports from uh, elected officials around the country that I've been calling them and harassing them and bragging, they're all true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I embrace the pet. I'll remember I, that. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Um, you. You said something, and I, I don't want to mischaracterize it, that kind of caught my attention. Um, the success of the clearance rates, I thought I heard you say, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, what was predicated upon um, overtime, use of overtime for, for, were you talking about the clearance rates or? N not really the clearance rates, just um, just coverage, response times as well. Which are good. Yeah, which are, which are good. Um, the more officers we have on the street that sign up for overtime to work in these slots and gaps, the better we respond, the better our service delivery is. Right. So. And I, I heard you say that the overtime is, is predicated upon volunteerism. Yes. I, um, that disturbs me. Um, the numbers are good, uh, but it disturbs me that essentially the protection of 300,000 people uh, is predicated upon goodwill. And I know there's a lot of goodwill amongst our officers. These are, that's why we call them the finest. We call the fire department the bravest. Um, but but I, that's problematic uh, to me as, as, a, as an elected official, as, as someone who's been entrusted with governance of the city. Uh, I, I don't believe that that good will, will ever run out. Uh, but from a governance point of view, I think depending upon volunteerism um, and goodwill from officers at a city that's operating way in the black is problematic. Um, and I think that that, that should be a, a matter for us to consider uh, moving forward. Um, as a council. The, um, the uptick in, in gun uh, incidents, um, what do you attribute it to? A number of things. It's uh, very concerning, uh, not just, you know, here in Durham, but, you know, around the country, the prevalence of guns on the street and the willfulness to use weapons, uh, even in the most minor kinds of situations is alarming. So um, the affinity to just shoot right. is, is very troubling and puzzling, especially as we continue to try to uh, address gang um, issues in the city. A lot of uh, what we see is supported by gang activity right. as well. Well, th there's certainly no argument that, that there's a gun culture in America that that's a problem for the country. But insofar as we have a baseline here locally in Durham of these incidents and there's a definite uptick, um, it, it, do, do we, is there, um, um, is there a gang war going on? Is something going on? Is there an, a flare up uh, on the streets that, that you're, you're aware of? Well, uh, we can say that there are various elements to uh, what we're seeing as it relates to different groups fighting. I would not say that Durham has a number of gangs. There are certain specific gang groups that or enterprises, uh, whether they're hybrid gang gangs or some of the traditional names that uh, we have seen quite a bit of activity, especially as it relates to uh, just beefs, you know, kind of back and forth between you know two or three groups. So um, without getting into too much detail, it's very real for us. And um, our efforts to combat this has been, uh, I would say threefold, to, to ensure that we have the visibility in the hottest areas, to ensure that we publicize information uh, as part of our laser-focused campaign against gun violence in the city of Durham, and to ensure that our community members are aware uh, as well of, 
of what we're what we're doing to try to uh, combat this. So um, we, when I say laser focus, we're looking for individuals who are committing these types of crimes. And we are not trying to cast a wide net on certain communities. We know that there are specific individuals that are involved and we have made significant arrests. Knock on wood, we had a really quiet weekend and um, which is very different than um, over you know, the last few weeks. So we have to continuously um, impress upon our officers to, number one, do what it is that taxpayers expect us to do. Mm -hmm. And that is to make our streets safe in the best way that we know how without offending people, but at the same time, finding that balance and um, addressing individuals that would do harm to anybody in this room or anybody on this council and deal with them in the appropriate manner. Thank you for that. F final question. It, it's, I guess, so, somewhat of a management metric question. Um, some of us as lay people look at the number of authorized officers, 547, and the number of actual 523, and we look at that gap as indication that, you know, we got empty spaces. Um, but I heard you talk about how many folks are going to graduate from the next BLET class. And, and that's, from a management point of view, do you wait till they're actual all filled before you ask for um, slots? Or it, what's, what's the logic behind that gap? And what does that look like actually from a managerial point of view, point of view particularly taking into account attrition? Exactly. So no matter what, you're going to always have attrition. People retire. People decide, you know what, my wife's got a job somewhere else. We always have to factor in attrition. When we see officers leaving out by the droves, we get concerned. We're not seeing that in the city of Durham right now. But we are working and recruiting to address just natural attrition. So when you have 25 officers that are in the academy, they're filling police officer positions, but they're not operational officers. They're going through a training program. So it might say that I have 98% fill, but I've got 25 or maybe even 50 that are in some form of training. So hiring and recruiting is, continues to be a priority for the department. When we get to a point where we're 100% staffed, we don't stop recruiting because we know people continue to retire and so on. Um, hiring more officers or overhiring officers sometimes is so that we can take into account that 10% of the individuals that go to our training won't make it through the training. So even though I sent 25 officers in that class, I could lose seven out of that class. So we continue continuously hire. So as a, as a manager, you don't actually build capacity at the moment you need it. Uh, you, you build it in anticipation. Is that, is that a fair? I build it in anticipation. We keep the, the, the system of hiring moving because we know those different you know, nuances that occur in our department that would cause us to be 30 officers down if we didn't continue that movement. And we also project for the future. What do we need for the future? What does the city need for the future? And in order to hire for the future, we, we may start an aggressive recruitment campaign so that we're hiring more officers in anticipation of potentially uh, filling vacancies. Thank you, Chief. Thank the men and women under your command. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions or comments from members of the council? Uh, Chief, I have just a couple of things. Um, since um, in, in recent weeks, we've had a very difficult time in Durham. We lost a nine-year-old child. Yes. And you and I have talked about this. We've met and managers and part of this group and all of our law enforcement folks around the city and the county have come together to strategize. Uh, and I think that you and the sheriff and the district attorney and our federal district attorney, 
uh, have all been very much in sync on this focused deterrence approach that you mentioned to make sure that we are doing everything we can to stop the relatively few mm -hmm. people who are creating a very significant amount of this violence. And I just want to say that uh, I very much endorse this focused deterrence approach, as you know. I know that our community does as well. Um, we are a city of second chances, as witnessed by the Misdemeanor Diversion Court, which Mayor Pro Tem talked about, uh, as witnessed by our transitional jobs program for people coming home from prison, our welcome home program, all the work we're doing to restore driver's licenses, for example. I believe we've now restored 34,000 driver's licenses to people who lost them because of non-payment of fines and fees. All this work is very important. But we also know that at the same time we're a city of second chances, that we are also a city that is not going to tolerate violent crime. And we can hold both of those things in our mind at once and do both of those things. And I just want to commend you and the department for striking what I think is a really good balance. Uh, the U visas is another example of a second chance. Uh, perhaps not a second chance, but a chance. And uh, for people to uh, be here in this country who have assisted our police department. We have many reforms like that that you have introduced. And at the same time, I think you're uh, absolutely focused on the right thing. Uh, in terms of the, your strategy for fighting this gun violence that we have faced. Uh, but I wondered if you had any more comments uh, on the, the last couple of weeks. You did mention that we had a quiet weekend, Labor Day weekend, uh, and uh, we were all very grateful for that. But do you have any other observations that you'd like to make to the council uh, regarding our, our current situation? We made some significant arrests in the last three days. Mm -hmm. And we believe that some of the individuals that we, we thought were involved um, in, in some of this activity, some of the arrests that we made may uh, help us to, um, or lead us to bring in some closure to some of it. Um, I'm not saying that it's gonna completely stop. We're gonna pray that it will, but we will continue to, and I have to commend my team because they have been working around the clock and not just because of um, the young man that was, was slain, you know, and all of this, I'm saying foolishness, that there are other young men in the city of Durham and other children that deserve to ride to get ice cream without being a victim. So we've taken it personally and, and I know everybody else has too. And uh, we plan to continue to um, identify those that would, would do that type of harm. And, and I think that's what's expected of us. All right. Chief, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Council Member? I just, just also noted, I, I just wanted to highlight and notice the officers mentioned, Officers Johnson and Taylor in your report, I just want to uplift that is also um, those life-saving measures that have been taken. And then um, specifically, and I don't want to mess up, uh, in this thing? Say that again. Officer in, in is thing? How do you say her, his or her last name? Her last name. Close enough. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's important to also highlight just how well our officers have adjusted under your leadership and noting that um, this officer recognized that a woman um, trying to find food for her child was, was stealing and out of necessity. Mm -hmm. And not, rather than charging, actually paying for that family's food for the evening actually makes such a huge impact. I mean, it just goes to show like that the culture of your office is definitely changing. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, we'll now turn to the uh, the traffic stop report, and uh, I believe we're to welcome Jason Sheese. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. I'll just I'll just tell the folks here because they don't know this, Chief, that 
we are very, very lucky in our department to have the services of Mr. Sheese as a statistician extraordinaire. Uh, he does a tremendous job in providing us with uh, in information, and we're, I, I mean that very much. You do a fabulous job, and it's good to have you here tonight. Thank you, Mayor. No, ma'am. You, the public comment, I will call on you with public comment when the time comes. Mr. Sheese. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Sheese. I'm the Analytical Services Manager for the Durham Police Department. Tonight, I will be presenting traffic stop data for the first six months of calendar year 2019, along with some trends for the same period in prior years. All data is derived from SBI 122 traffic stop reports that are completed by law enforcement officers in accordance with state law. The first slide covers the volume of traffic stops made by members of the agency over a 10-year period. There were 7,616 traffic stops made in the first six months of this year, which is a 14% increase from the same period last year. The number of traffic stops in 2019 is less than half of what it was in 2010. The red vertical line on the chart represents October 2014, when the requirement to obtain written consent to search vehicles was implemented as agency policy. This slide covers the racial composition of who was stopped. The chart shows the ratio of drivers stopped in the first six months of this year who were black compared to the residential population for major cities in North Carolina. For Durham, 63% of stopped drivers were black. This ratio has ranged from 58% to 63% over the last five years and is noticeably higher than the underlying black population of the city, which is 41%. Similar disparities are observed elsewhere in North Carolina ranging from a spread of 16 percentage points in Greensboro to 27 percentage points in Raleigh. However, research shows that benchmarking traffic stops to U.S. Census population is not a best practice for determining racial bias, as it does not reasonably estimate the driving population at risk. An alternative method developed by RTI International shows there was no difference for Durham between the risk of a black driver being stopped during daylight hours and the risk of being stopped during darkness. The text box that you see on the chart shows the total traffic stops made this year by the cities on the chart. Durham had by far the fewest number of stops with only Greensboro being close. The first two slides covered the volume of traffic stops and the racial composition of who was stopped. This slide covers the reason for the traffic stop. <coughs> There are three major categories of reasons for traffic stops, driver-based vi driver violations, vehicle-based violations, and other violations, which are mostly investigative stops. The chart shows the ratio of traffic stops that came from vehicle-based violations over the last five years for black, white, and Hispanic drivers. Vehicle-based violations include both vehicle regulatory and equipment violations. In the first six months of this year, 46% of all traffic stops came from these types of violations for black drivers, 26% for white drivers, and 32% for Hispanic drivers. There is a very consistent pattern that you'll see for how this ratio has changed over the last five years for each of the major racial and ethnic groups. The increase in enforcement over the last two years is pretty evenly distributed among these groups. Vehicle-based violations produce the majority of probable cause searches, which is also a very consent across the racial and ethnic groups. 59% of all probable cause searches came from these types of stops for black drivers, 56% for white drivers, and 59% for Hispanic drivers. No enforcement action was taken in 61% of all traffic stops for black drivers, which is the highest ratio over the five-year period. The ratio was 53% for white drivers and 46% for Hispanic drivers in 2019. This slide covers the searches that occurred as the result of traffic stops. The chart shows the volume of searches that have occurred over the last five years, 
broken down by the three most common types. In the first six months of this year, there were 376 probable cause searches and 40 searches each from the consent and search incident to arrest categories. The table shows the ratio of all traffic stops in which a search occurred over the last five years for the major racial and ethnic groups. For black drivers, the ratio went up from last year to 8.67%, which was virtually identical to 2016. The ratio went down in 2019 for white and Hispanic drivers to 2.11 and 3.01% respectively. The overall increase in vehicle searches over the last two years has been from the probable cause category, representing 79% of all searches in 2019. The ratio of consent searches in which some contraband was found was 8% in 2019. It was 51% for probable cause searches and 15% for search incident to arrest. The last slide covers the result of the searches that were conducted. The chart shows the ratio of searches that resulted in a hit over the last five years for each of the major racial and ethnic groups. A hit is defined as a search in which some type of contraband, such as money, drugs, or weapons, is located, regardless of whether it was the type originally being sought. For all racial and ethnic groups, the hit rate increased from last year to this year. For 2019, the rate was highest during the five-year period, crossing above 40%. The text box shows the categories of contraband represented by the 206 searches in which one or more items was found. 70% were drugs. In summary, the frequency of traffic stops is up over the last two years, but well below most other major North Carolina agencies. Vehicle-based violations are more represented over the last two years and produce the majority of searches for all major racial and ethnic groups. Black drivers are searched at a higher rate than white and Hispanic drivers, but have enforcement action taken against them less frequently. The hit rate on searches in 2019 was the highest over the last 10 years for all major racial and ethnic groups. Overall, traffic stops and searches are up over the last two years, but they lead to less enforcement and more contraband found. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheese. I'm gonna now ask if there are questions or comments by members of the council. Anybody? <coughs> I have a question. Um, The 51% the hit rate in the probable cause searches um, and the, the increase in that hit rate, what does that mean? Does that mean that the searches are, I mean, that the, that the decision to search is a higher quality decision than we were making in the past? We're making better decisions about when to search? Yes, sir, that's a fair observation. So above 51% or above 50% is uh, significant. Um, and so, yes, I would concur that better quality searches are, uh, are occurring and therefore they are producing results in the way of contraband being found. Um, when we, uh, on the council in 2014, I believe the year was, uh, we made the decision for, uh, for written consent for consent searches. One of the things that we found then was that the consent searches were producing very low hit rates. And um, <coughs> that uh, continues to be true, even though the consent searches are, are way, way down. Um, and um, so uh, any, any observations that you have, uh, any other observations that you have about our searches, uh, are we making in general the right decisions uh, and what do you have anything to say about any conclusions to draw about the fact that our uh, the, the there's the, the percentage of enforcement actions against African American drivers who are stopped is lower than the enforcement actions against any other groups any other any observations to make about that or any thoughts that you have to offer us um, two things that I heard in, in your question. One is uh, really the, the hit rate on consent searches. So that policy change occurred in October of 2014, yes, sir. Um, 
I would postulate that the hit rate on consent searches will always lag far behind probable cause searches for a number of reasons. Uh, one, consent searches are completely voluntary. Probable cause searches are based upon observable and uh, specifically articulable facts by the officer that would lead a, a reasonable and prudent person to conclude that there was contraband inside the vehicle. So uh, immediately there, there is a, a higher likelihood of there being contraband found. Uh, so that does not surprise me. Um, uh, the other part of your uh, question, I'm sorry. Is, the, is the, the difference in, what conclusions do you draw in, when you're thinking about the difference in uh, the enforcement uh, that we see uh, against African-American drivers versus other uh, groups uh, after a, a stop? Um, what, what I would say is that uh, black drivers are more represented in the vehicle equipment and regulatory violation stops, um, as you saw in the presentation. Uh, equally, though, both black and white drivers for those types of stops, 70% of the time, seven out of 10, there was no enforcement action taken for those specific type of stops. Uh, therefore, the, the reason is for the stop is not to write somebody a ticket. Um, one could be simply to make them aware uh, of an equipment violation that may, they may not have otherwise been aware of. So it may very well be educational. Um, in some cases, it may lead to a probable cause search, as, as I alluded to in the presentation. But the, the underlying pattern is that seven out of 10 times, uh, there's no enforcement action taken. And approximately what percentage of the stops are in that category? Thirty-nine percent of all traffic stops in the first six months were from vehicle-based violations. Got it. So that's a lot of them. And I appreciate very much the department's policy not to criminalize those kinds of violations. Uh, and I think it's been a real benefit to our community. So, Chief and all of you all, thank you for that. Um, and finally, Mr. Sheis, uh, you mentioned the Veil of Darkness study. Our the the Veil of Darkness study that the first one I remember was conducted perhaps four years ago, I'm thinking? I believe the report was produced in 2015. 2015. Sure. And in that study, uh, we found that black drivers, that, that, bef that bef the, the same officers were stopping African-American drivers at a higher percentage than white drivers before dark, but not after dark. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> yes, sir. And there, I believe there was a five-year study period that the RTI report covered. Um, in the earlier years of that five-year span, there was some disparity. So the veil of darkness method does not specifically look at the ratio of drivers that are black or white or Hispanic. It could be 63%, it could be 20%. It specifically looks at whether there's any difference in that ratio during daylight hours yeah. and in darkness. And towards the end of that study period into 2015, that disparity started to go away. And what we've seen over the last several years is uh, there is no difference. Uh, the risk ratio for the first six months was exactly 1.0. Yeah. And that's a great change. And I just want to, again, commend the department. Um, I think it's this Veil of Darkness study is a really interesting methodology. Uh, and I want to thank the department for continuing to work with RTI to, because this is one of the ways that we make sure that we're not police, policing in a discriminatory manner. And I just want to thank you. And uh, Mr. Sheese, uh, thank you for continuing to provide us with this information. Yes, sir, my pleasure. All right, any other questions or comments from members of the council? council uh, Mayor Pro Tem and then Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you for this data. It's really helpful. Could you give me an example of when a vehicle or equipment or regulatory violation might lead to a probable cause search? Um, 
So the original probable cause for the stop would be something having to do with a, a safety violation having to do with the vehicle itself, mm -hmm. such as it could be a smashed windshield or some other type of a safety issue or a regulatory problem like the, the vehicle's registration is expired. Uh, during the course of the officer conducting that stop and uh, getting the driver's information and the information that they need in order to determine whether a violation has, has occurred and to de determine how to resolve that, the officer may observe um, specific factors which would lead him or her to conclude that there's probably contraband within the vehicle. Um, and that is a, a probable cause standard for them to act on that. What kind of observations might those be? Um, it could be the uh, smell of burning marijuana emanating from the interior of the vehicle. It could be a handgun in plain sight. Um, those would be a couple of the immediate types of um, things that an officer may observe. Thank you. And do we do we have data on what the like what the probable cause was for these sorts of searches that we could take a look at? Uh, the SBI 122 form does capture the basis for the search. Mm -hmm. um, that's not within my population, but there is data captured. Uh, there are several different categories, and the basis could be one or more of those categories. It won't always fit into just one. So okay. we certainly could provide that as a, as a follow-up if needed. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Council Member Freeman? I just, I just also wanted to note that the HRC recommendations were included, and I just wanted to, to just express an appreciation for continuing to work towards meeting those goals and keeping it going. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sheese, thank you. And we're going to have some public comment. Uh, and uh, thank you all very much. But uh, we're, you all can take a seat, Chief. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to begin the public comment. And I'm going to call first Mr. Chris Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany, welcome. Please give us your name and address. And you have three minutes. Chris Tiffany, P.O. Box 25331-27702. Fight crime, not the usual suspects. Young black males profiled as suspects on site. Harassment is not law enforcement. The shot spotter proposal put down by council was supposedly too expensive at less than $1 per person in a budget of a couple hundred million dollars, less than half a penny on the dollar. You spend lots of time and money on PR, but this is real life and death stuff. It helps if it helps catch one shooter prevents one shooting or saves one life, it's worth trying. Try it. Give it a shot. And any committee supposedly taking suggestions from the public should have well-publicized public meetings and members of the public with information and or suggestions should not be subjected to slander or threats. You need criminal gang intelligence, but you won't get much if you won't protect your sources. General Order 1036 still fails to do that. Fix the policy. You know what I'm talking about. Fix it. Thank you very much, Mr. Tiffany. We're now going to call, I'm going to call several other people. <coughs> Excuse me, if you could come up here to my right. I will begin with Ms. Jackie Wagstaff, Shay Ramirez, Cheryl Smith, Dennis Garrett, you all could please come over to my right. That would be great. Ms. Wagstaff, welcome. <coughs> it's always good to have another former city council member in the in the house. Who's that? that you know, I never get that. <laughs> Ms. Wagstaff, welcome. You have three minutes. Please give well, us your name. Well, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, council members. Um, I'm not going to stay up here very long. I probably won't even use up those three minutes. But I just wanted to say that... Um, I think that our city is in a crisis now. You know, we've had council members, and, and, I, and I really, right now, I'm feeling some kind of way because I know that I believe that this city is in a crisis and some things could have been done differently from certain council members. And we should not be at this point, this pivotal point that we're at where the citizens deserve better from this council. This community deserves better. There are people out there in the community that are boots on the ground. Now, I see a lot of people in here, and they come in here, and they do their little thing and everything, but I'm on those streets every day, and I see a few people that's out there with me. 
with the boots on the ground. Unfortunately, when you're not in that group of people that have favoritism, you're normally not heard here. And we know this, and we understand that, but it doesn't stop us from doing what we do out in the streets. Now, I'm very concerned, I think it's very insensitive for a council member to approach another council member and accuse a council member of capitalizing off a nine years old death. That's a problem for me. And the streets are talking. They heard it all. That is a serious problem, insensitivity to the fact that if another council member felt that they needed to go and support a family during a time like this when they lost their nine-year-old time, child to this street, this violence is going on. And I heard somebody ask, I heard one of you ask, what is the cause of it? Gang this, gang that. Everything is not about gangs. But if you're out here in these streets and you know what these streets are saying, you know why these crimes are being committed. Economics is the driving force to most of this crime. If their economics are improved, this crime will go down. This council has to start refocusing on investing in the things that work. We had things. I heard a young man say he got out of prison 10 years. He said his downfall was when the city council closed all the rec centers in the black community. That was the downfall. That's what caused him to go into the criminal life because he left the rec center and went to the streets. And the streets called him. And when they started shooting at him, he started shooting back. And it got him 10 years. And then you say this welcome home, pro this welcome home program. Do the people that you welcome back to Durham, do you give them the keys to an apartment to welcome them home? Because most of them, when they come back out of the system that they've been in for 10 or more years, they don't have a family structure anymore. And if there are people out there that will allow them to live in their property, this is probably public housing, where they can't live because of regulations. So what is welcome home? A bag of toiletries and a letter from the mayor does nothing for you when you have to sleep on the streets. I am upset. Thank you, Ms. Wagstaff. We'll now hear from Ms. We'll now, we'll now hear from Ms. Shea Ramirez. Ms. Ramirez, welcome. Please give us your name and address. Shea Ramirez, Ten Fielding Court. Good evening. How, how is everyone doing? Good. Thank you so much. Okay. So my name is Shea Ramirez. Um, I am a 20, 2017 mayoral candidate. Um, I'm a mother, a substitute teacher, and a wife, and a business owner. Um, also a community leader. Um, and I am sick of the crime myself. Um, we've been doing a lot of visuals, we've been doing a lot of praying, we've been doing a lot of talking about what we're going to do, and I am a person of action. I don't like to do a lot of talking, I like to do things. Um, so I'm going to be doing the very first ever Durham Bull City ceasefire. Um, I need you guys' help. I, I have a leverage, I um, mean, I have a recording studio. I am the first and only African-American woman in North Carolina to have a recording studio, State of the Arts recording studio. So on a regular basis, a daily basis, I deal with a lot of the gang members. So people that you might not want to interact with, you might not want to talk to, be around, I'm around them every single day. Um, a lot of them are very respectful. I don't have any issues with them, they respect me. And I've spoken with them about this and they are willing to do it. Um, because I asked them to. So I am willing to be at the forefront of this. I'm willing to stay in the front, but I need you guys to help me. Um, the ceasefire is going to consist of a whole week um, from Sunday starting out as a mentoring day uh, to getting the young men uh, ready, job ready, um, resume uh, skills, interviewing skills, etiquette, uh, dressing properly other than going to court, um, teach them how to tie a tie. Monday, I mean, I'm sorry, two, Monday will be a job fair that's fair. Um, individuals that have criminal backgrounds, they will be able to possibly get jobs. When I'm talking to some of the gang members, their thing is, Ms. Shea, we can't get jobs, we need jobs. So I'm trying to find out what they need and then incorporate it in some type of event, present it to the community, and then you guys follow. Uh, Tuesday will be a fitness day. Um, fitness, you know, for me, works for me. It produces a happy gene. 
Um, we're going to be doing Zumba and line dance on the um, CCB Plaza at the Bull on that Tuesday from 6 to 8. Uh, Wednesday, I am working right now. I have a meeting with Durham Tech on um, Monday um, to possibly have them come out um, and present to them um, schooling. Because a lot of them, they, they want to get better jobs, but they don't want to go to school for two and four years. So they can go, you know, get their CDL, something, some type of training that they can get quick to make a decent amount of money to make a, you know, a affordable living wage. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramirez. We appreciate it, and thank you for those ideas, and we look forward to hearing more about them. Thank I have the so information much. here if you guys want it. Um, yeah, my card and my information. Ms. Cheryl Smith. Hello, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. I'm here because it's been November made 14 years since my son was murdered, gun violence. That's just how long I've been fighting. And we're still going through the same problem. We get gang um, adventure money. You all get all this money. Where is it going? I mean, gang, this stuff should be at least not this bad. We've been going through this for years. When is thing gonna change? Even when we get new council members, we still have the same problems. Now, I'm, I'm here to say, we can't, an uh, active community does decrease crime. I know this, we did it in Franklin Village until this year. We, had, we went from going, ha having shoes every day to not having any because we, we started having activities in our community. We was there for those children. We had our community center open. Now, all we have is shooting. We'd had six shooting in our community already this year. This is the community where the eight-year-old got shot in the back, laying in her bed, sleep. That was the sixth shooting. Before the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, I reached out to all of you. Not one person did a thing. This shooting could have been prevented. A lot of stuff could be prevented. But I'm here because we want our community center back open. I don't even want to be part of the resident council anymore. I just want some activities in our community. This, commu this our community center has been shut down for a, almost a whole year now, and not one of you came out and did a thing. Not one of you been in the National Night Out in, in Franklin Village last year, and I was told you weren't there this year, because I didn't attend, because of what's going on in our community. Our community has went down. Myself and Charles C. Russell worked very hard in our community for the last 10 years to keep a child from being shot. And now here we go again. And our community has really gone down. Now our community center, the back of the community center, is where people come to meet drug dealers. This is all day long, back and forth. Residents still complaining. We're fighting to get sex offenders from out our community. No one is helping us. And we continue to look, but y'all want to know why we continue to have these crimes, because you don't listen to the community. You don't listen to the right people that's out there, that's seeing this. And you all know what's going on, but you just look the other way. I would like to see every community recreation center open, activities for all these kids. The school system needs to stop treating our children like they're not human. Because that's what's going on. The problem is starting from the school system, then to that courthouse. You need to start working with us black parents. Not all of us are bad. Mm. We're out there. I was I was fought for my son for two years, and I let the fisher didn't do a thing. Thank you, Ms. Smith. <laughs> Mr. Dennis Garrett. Mr. Garrett, welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Okay, my name is Dennis Garrett. I live at 1801 Ange Avenue, right here in Durham. This little gentleman with me is uh, nine years old, I mean, 11 years old. That was his friend that got killed on Duke Street, right? And like, <clears throat> the reason why he came, he said he wanted to meet the chief of police and he wanted to meet the mayor. Because like, not his, he ain't hanging out with people to steal it no more. He wanted to do something positive in his community, right? So, you know, the, the time that I got, I want to say <clears throat> that the young lady that came up, uh, Miss Jackie, you, you, you made a lot of sense about the, the city council members not being in our community. However, we do got some city council members that, that are active. 
Mark, I like what you was, the questions you was asking. Like, it went so long, I forgot what I really wanted to say. But, Chief, I do want to say thank you because this, just the other day, you know, your presence make a difference. The other day I was um, pulling up in, the, um, in my community, and I saw Captain Allen and Captain Tate. They was walking the block. They was walking, and, and they, they took time to stop and have a conversation. That's what we need back is communication amongst our officers. Like this little man was raised to believe that man down, so he automatically assumed that the police is bad. Well, he know today that you guys are here to protect and to serve. But if you ain't got the right police officers to protect and to serve, because, you know, I heard you say priority. Um, what's the priority? You know, whether or not, who's to determine what's the priority in my neighborhood, whether or not the police can answer my call because another call is being going on. And also, um, talking about city council, they up for re-election. You know, are y'all running around saying, vote for Tom and vote for, well, I'm saying don't vote for Julia. I'm saying like, don't vote. Don't vote for those that ain't doing for our community. We are, we are like, like spread the message. Say don't vote for those that ain't doing right by our community. Why are we gonna keep them up there and they ain't doing right by us, right? So I wanna say thank you, Mr. Mayor, for coming to my neighborhood. I want to say thank you, Deidreana, for coming in my neighborhood. I want to say thank you, Charlie, for coming in my neighborhood. Uh, I want to say thank you, Mark, for coming in my neighborhood. But those who I didn't name, that mean they ain't coming in my neighborhood. So why are we going to keep voting for them? Don't vote for Julian. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. We'll now hear from Mr. Rafiq Zaidi. I'm sorry? I was saying thank you. You're so welcome. Yep. Mr. Rafiq Zaidi. Mr. Zaidi, welcome. Please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. Yes, my name is Rafiq Zaidi. I reside at 807 South Duke Street. I'm the president, as of now, of Fearless Men and Women with Boots on the Ground and Jackets and Members. First, I want to thank Chief Davis for your second annual quarter report, which was very enlightening. And I want to thank Deidre Anna. When I called her, when I sent the message to her the other day, I said, I want to make sure that our children on these school buses were being safe in light of all the shooting that was going on in the city. And you told me that you would go speak to members of the school board to make sure that there's some safeguards being put on our children. Shooting, this city has become known, not as Bull City, but Bullet City, all across the country. And I want to say this. We are tired of being traumatized in the city of Durham with these shootings. The murder of Brother Zion Pearson will be captured. Let me repeat that again. He will be apprehended. Councilman Middleton, you asked a very important question about gangs. Let me give you a root underneath what you see as gangs. There is a video and the police have access to this video. A former police officer showed it to me approximately four days ago. In this video, it's called the CAP, C-A-P, CAP. All across the country, gangs are being recruited out of the community on the basis of who can create the best hip hop music. The CAP despicts young men and women in Durham in a hotel going through sexual activities. The cap despicts MacDougal terrorists. Our children in MacDougal terrorists is in this video. They are in this video. The background to this video respects our young children. And they are, uh, there's a robbery going on across the country with these gangs. Who can capitalize and get the best video on the scene will go to the top. That's why they call it the cap. And in my conclusion, let me say this. We know who these people are, but I'm not the law enforcement. So we form men and women with boots on the ground. We have a hotline number for them to call us, and we want you to put down these weapons. Come to us. We're not going to turn you into no law enforcement. Chief Davis, you need more men on the ground. I'm sorry that they denied you what you need. You need some officers on the ground. And when you, requ when you requested for that relief, relief, you were denied. And that's a big mistake that was made by certain members on this council. In my conclusion, 
ICE, ICE. There are rumors that there are some of my Latino brothers who are refusing to be deported. Thank you, Mr. Zaidi. And they are arming themselves. Mm. Ms. 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 Victoria Peterson. Ms. Peterson, welcome. Please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. I'm Mrs. Peterson, Victoria Peterson, I, and I do not want to be rude, but Mr. Mayor, you had no business telling that chief to go sit down when we had some questions for her. You had no business of doing it, Mr. Mayor. I have some questions for the chief, and I would like the chief to come up there so I could ask her my questions. Chief. Madam chief, 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 here is chief. my question. Chief, chief, chief. 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 Tell me, Chief Davis, can you, can you please right where you me, are is good. No, no. Can you please tell me, Mr. Ch um, Madam Chief Davis, when you do the crime report, do, Ms. Peterson. does your crime report include part one, part two, as well as the juvenile? Ms. Peterson, I would ask you to, to please address the council, not Chief Davis. Thank you very much. Well, these meetings, when they you know, give you know the report, rules, Ms. Peterson, allowed to address them. But anyway, I can still face this way. Uh, Chief Davis. I would like that answer if you can send it an email or whatever. I want to know when you do your police report and when you do your budget, and folks, the African American community, we are upset with the crime and the murdering that is going on in this community. And we have folks that, has, that are sitting on this council that deny this woman, this chief, additional officers. Can I give you the real crime report? For last year, we had over 16,000 crimes committed in this city. I have two degrees <coughs> in law enforcement. This year, we've had over 20-some murders. The majority of those murders are people of color. I've, and then I'm not trying to be rude to my mayor, but my mayor is white. I'm black. I live in the African-American community. We hear the shooting and the killing. They're not shooting at him, and they're not killing, trying to kill him. And I'm glad, and I'm happy, but I'm upset with the mayor. And I'm upset with these three up here, you three up here, who voted against to give this woman additional police officers. And we got a nine-year-old boy murdered in this community. We have mine, mine, my, 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 I'm sorry, I need to calm down, Miss Weeks, <coughs> Miss Weeks a citizen in this community that lives around the corner was shot last year, and in three days she died. I was told she was shot by a 15-year-old boy where his father gave him a gun, and they were out there shooting. This is what is going on in the black community in Durham, North Carolina. And you tell us to come over here, sit down and shut up? You tell the police chief to go sit down? And we've got questions and concerns? Police Chief Davis, could you please have a meeting with the community? I want a meeting with the community, with the police officers. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. I want the state department in here. Thank I want you. the federal department in here. Thank you, Ms. And Peterson. We need, to get the we need to get the military in here. I want the military in here, too. Ms. Peterson. I know what the Constitution says. Chief Davis. Chief Davis, thank you all very we much for being here. To life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this city is in violation of the Constitution of the United States. Ms. Peterson. Of the, of the amendment of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Ms. And Peterson. I want to thank all of the police officers for coming out. Thank you, and God bless. Ms. Peterson. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. We're now going to move to item 12. We're going to go ahead and do these items ahead of the, uh, the public hearing items so that we can get our staff uh, home at a reasonable time. And uh, Ms. Peterson, I believe you called item 12 uh, off the consent agenda. Please uh, come to the podium. Welcome. And you have three minutes. I just want to think that I'm, I'm glad that we do need to have some our recreation centers and I think I heard somebody here say something about our recreation centers. I have been around to some of our recreation centers that look like they're just shut down, the one over there in Meduga Terrace. So whatever these centers need, 
We need to start funding, and also citizens, our city is sitting on $47 million. And the, and the balance fund, or what's the fund, Paul, Mr. Mayor? Mr. The Peterson. fund balance. Our mayor and city officials are sitting on $47 million of tax money. And we've got all this crime and these kids out here on the streets and have nowhere to play. And the, and the seniors, we have seniors in this community. We have a right to go out in our community. One senior facility downtown, come on. Come on, Mr. Mayor. I believe you're running for office also. And I think it's time for a new mayor in this city. I think it's time for some new leadership in this community. Steve is OK, but you've got to have some fire in your belt. This community needs to be cleaned up. And we need some more senior citizens programs in this community. And if we can give this rec center some monies to fix it up, to expand it, and also have a part there, Mr. Mayor, and actually, I gave Bill Bell that name. I didn't give that name to you, Steve. I gave it to Bill Bell. He was Mr. Mayor. I gave it to him. You need to step up and do better in this community. And you other folks who are on this council, you need to support him. And let's start using some of that money in that um, fund balance. Now, besides the rec, the W.D. Hill, Hill Recreation Center that you want to expand, Let's try to look at some of the other ones, Ms. Freeman. Ms. Freeman, she represents my area. She knows about uh, the TD Grady. Does that not look like a mess over there? Oh, I thank God now the chief, um, the, new, the old uh, police chief, he's running Ms. Freeman. He is running uh, a karate program out of there for the kids in the evening. But that building still sits up there, basically 24-7, all during the day, all during the night and walking distance of McDougal Terrace, where the shooting and the killing is going on. Why can't you put a GED program up there? Did I not hear Durham Tech talk about the stuff that they're doing over there? Durham Tech is in walking distance of McDougal Terrace. In walking distance. I know, Mr. May, I know you wish I'd go sit down. I am. Thank you very much, Ms. Peterson. Uh, we'll now have... Uh, uh, design services with Vines Architecture. Uh, do I hear a motion that so we approve moved. the, the motion to uh, design services for the Weaver Street and W.D. Hill Recreation Center renovations? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. We approve the item. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. <clears throat> please open the vote, Madam Clerk. Not working. It's open. It's open. It's open. Please close the vote. Thank you. Motion passes seven zero. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to item fifteen. Ms. Peterson, I believe you've pulled this item. Uh, welcome. You have three minutes. Ms. Peterson, we're starting your clock right now. You have three minutes. I get up here with your foolishness. I just would like to just say that we need to have a better way uh, for our zoning and our property and what you want to build on the various properties. And that's the only thing I really want to say on that, Mr. Mayor. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. We'll now have a motion to, uh, on item 15, contract SW67 for $1.5 million in approximately in sidewalk repairs. Move Madam move. Clerk, sorry, I'm sorry, we have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, you please open the vote. Let's close the vote. Thank you. And the motion passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Well, I'll now move to item. 17, the last item on our agenda, public hearing item, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment, Expounding Housing Choices. Uh, and uh, 
forward to hearing from staff. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, Pat Young, planning director. Um, before I um, briefly introduce this item, I, I want to quickly recognize and appreciate the project team who um, produced the material you see tonight and that uh, has most importantly led the community engagement and the outreach and uh, the development of this project. Scott Whiteman, our policy and urban design manager. Uh, Michael Stock, senior planner. Uh, not with us tonight is senior planner Kayla Seibel. And I also want to recognize uh, Hannah Jacobson, who left to be planning director in Salisbury, but worked a lot on this project. So thanks to them. I'd also like to quickly certify for the record that uh, this public hearing item was advertised in accordance with the requirements of law. Uh, and there are affidavit, there's an affidavit to that effect on file with the planning department. Expanding housing choices, or EHC, is a, a project that's intended to allow more housing and a greater diversity of housing types uh, in Durham, particularly in our urban tier neighborhoods, which are um, the map is provided of the urban tier in your material, and it's approximately two miles in every direction from downtown. Um, these are the neighborhoods where there's the highest demand uh, for housing and where we've made the greatest investments in services such as transit and infrastructure. The goals of the initiative are to make housing more accessible to more households across a spectrum of household sizes and incomes and to help promote a sustainable pattern of growth. Uh, historically, uh, in Durham and across the country, neighborhoods adapted uh, slowly and incrementally over time to increasing demand for housing. And in many of our pre-World War II neighborhoods here in Durham, you see a diversity of housing types such as duplexes, triplexes, and garden apartments. Um, the map on this slide uh, overlays area where the federal government, through the Homeowners Loan uh, Corporation, uh, restricted lending, also known as redlining, uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and that overlays that with areas that currently have single family only zoning or zoning that allows only single family housing. Um, although no one today intends it, uh, single family only zoning uh, was and is a vestige of and a key tool of and a perpetuator of uh, historical structural racism in our city uh, and other places where it's been applied. Um, single family only zoning worsens racial and intergenerational equity by restricting opportunities to housing in the areas of our community where there are the greatest opportunities for employment, uh, education, access to governmental services, and the EHC intends to be a small part of helping uh, reverse this along with other policies that this council has promoted. There's a constellation of factors which we've spoken to you about and to the community about extensively over the last 15 months as we've developed this project, uh, and they're depicted on the slide, that have worsened the impact of single family only zoning on affordability and housing access. Uh, most significantly, and there are many, uh, in our opinion, is the projected uh, increase in Durham's population. The demand for housing in Durham is driving um, all of the, the factors that are leading to our affordability crisis here in Durham. Um, Durham's population is projected to uh, increase by approximately 160,000 persons over the next 30 years, which translates to a need for approximately 62,000 new housing units. <clears throat> and these factors have led to a significant increase in the price of housing in Durham since the end of the last recession, 2013-2014. Um, and this is a phenomenon that's been seen in urban areas across the country where there's a preponderance of area zone for single family only zoning. Um, since this is such a widespread phenomenon, the National League of Cities um, recently released recommendations for cities to help address housing affordability uh, and access. Um, two of the key uh, recommendations are on this slide. Um, the first is one that City Council has been very aggressive and progressive in pursuing which is establishing local programs to finance affordable housing and support housing equity. Uh, the second is what they call, quote, modernizing local land use policies to rebalance housing supply and demand. And that is exactly what the proposal before Unite intends to do. You see also in this slide a partial list of cities uh, that have either begun uh, or completed um, a very similar effort. And we've published a detailed literature review on our website um, to talk about the status of these, but uh, we are not alone by any means, but uh, we are leading the way in North Carolina. <clears throat> so as noted at the beginning of this presentation, we began this process in May of last year, 2018, uh, with the goal of allowing for increased housing where it's most needed. Um, but it always was and remains our intent that this be done in a way that is incremental 
and that respects existing uh, neighborhood character. Incrementalism is critical because it is uh, undesirable to um, accelerate neighborhood change, change that's happening today, as I said earlier, due to high demand for housing. Uh, but it is critical that the proposed changes before you tonight uh, incentivize the private market and nonprofit builders to build new housing units where they're most needed. And so this is a delicate balance that we've tried to strike throughout the process by listening uh, to all parts of our community. Uh, and we believe that what's before you tonight strikes that balance. Another goal of EHC is to reduce the rate of increase in housing prices, especially in the highest demand areas. Um, although this initiative would uh, incentivize and allow for additional uh, affordable housing supply um, specifically, we have stressed throughout this initiative, um, the development process that EHC is in no way a silver bullet solution for housing affordability. Um, the vast majority of direct beneficiaries of the provisions in this initiative would likely be middle and upper middle income uh, home buyers and renters who can't afford to compete for new market rate housing that might be built under these provisions. Although we do believe a um, significant amount of new affordable housing would be built um, because of changes to the affordable housing density bonus associated with this initiative and other incentives for affordable housing. Um, the most significant impact of EHC we believe uh, is, is potential to have large but indirect impacts on housing affordability uh, there's recent scholarship by Dr. Evan Mast of the Nonpartisan Upjohn Institute. Um, the full study is linked on our website. Uh, Dr. Mast found that building 100 new market rate units in a community opens up the equivalent of 70 units in neighborhoods earning below the area's median income, and in the poorest neighborhoods opens up the equivalent of 40 units. Uh, this is due to relatively higher income households in those neighborhoods taking advantage of new housing opportunities in higher demand areas. Uh, and making their existing housing available to lower income residents. Uh, in other words, there's emerging evidence that new construction makes homes more affordable even for those who can't afford the new units. Um, as we've discussed previously, um, we made each see a priority because it addresses one of the city's top priorities, the housing ac access and affordability. Um, but we also committed to a thorough public engagement process which lasted um, the entirety of our initiative for 15 months uh, and we um, participated in or conducted over four dozen community events, uh, consultation with neighborhood groups, boards and commissions, um, developers uh, that do small housing development of the type proposed by EHC. And our goal was to listen to uh, all parts of the Durham community and we, we did that uh, effectively. Our efforts to listen to all parts of Durham community and to continue to refine the EHC provisions based on what we heard um, led to a number of different revisions and drafts to the EHC. In November of 2018, we released what we call the discussion draft. Um, then in March, based on feedback we got from community members, we made modifications and changes to what to went to the Planning Commission for their consideration. The Planning Commission appointed a subcommittee uh, of members that made a separate and independent recommendation, which you have in detail in your report, uh, that they adopted in June. And then there, the uh, current staff proposal differs from those, and I, I know that is a lot of, um, th that makes this even a complex subject matter even more complex, but there is a very detailed um, overview and summary, and then of course a detailed description of those changes uh, in your agenda material. And so we think that um, the, the balance that's before you tonight meets the intent of the, of the initiative as I described it earlier. It was shaped very extensively by public input and, and feedback on earlier drafts. And one of the things we heard from across the community is that this should be as clear and simple as possible, and we certainly think the draft before you tonight does that. There's four key areas that the Expanding Housing Choices uh, text commitment that's here in front of you for your consideration addresses, and I'll briefly summarize each of those, again, much more detail in your report, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. The first is accessory dwelling units. Um, as you know, we've allowed accessory dwelling units on single-family properties since 2006 by right, meaning with an administrative approval um, throughout the county, but we've only had uh, 80, approximately 80 of these units permitted in that time. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is the restrictions that were embedded in that 2006 regulation. So what we are proposing with this initiative is to allow a standard, meaning up to, up to 800 square feet, uh, accessory dwelling unit for every uh, residential structure, including duplexes, uh, as well as three accessory dwelling units for properties and civic uses, such as places of worship. 
A second key area is, is duplexes. In almost every regard, uh, utilities, building code, for example, duplexes are regulated and treated like single family houses. They have very similar impacts on neighborhood character as single family houses. Uh, and as such, we are recommending that duplexes be allowed throughout residential districts in the urban tier and that lot size requirements be the same as single family housing. This would essentially make single family uh, only zoning uh, illegal and increase by at least 100% the number of housing opportunities in the urban tier. Uh, a third key area are lot sizes and densities. Um, we left zoning densities and lot sizes unchanged except for two key changes. One is that we're proposing a 2,000 um, square foot small lot option that would allow for a duplex or single family dwelling um, it, it, in the zoning districts identified on the slide. The footprint of, of a structure built on that would be limited to 800 square feet with a maximum heated square foot of, uh, building square foot of 1,200 square feet. Um, we also are um, recommending um, dry standards that minimize impervious surface through driveway design and that require additional trees to help enhance our tree canopy. Um, and that we are proposing a narrow flagpole option so that lots with limited frontage on streets can have a, a smaller access drive and that um, property to the side or rear properties can be developed uh, without significant impact on neighborhood character. Uh, and finally, uh, we're making two key changes to our infill standards. These are standards that have been in the UDO since its adoption in 2006, designed to ensure compatibility of new development with uh, existing development and existing neighborhoods. And they've largely worked well, so we're making uh, very few recommended changes. One group of changes is to increase tree canopy and mitigate stormwater runoff, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and the second is to uh, remove the lot width infill standard. Um, having minimum lot widths significantly impedes the ability of um, housing to be developed on lots that are uh, smaller, which many lots in the urban tier are. And there are a host of kind of miscellaneous changes um, that are detailed uh, in your uh, staff report. One I'll, pa I'll point out is to allow um, duplexes and townhouses and um, cluster and conservation subdivisions in the, suburb in the suburban tier, which is something that's been, uh, we think has a lot of potential to, um, to be used and significantly increase um, the amount of affordable housing in that location. So um, one of the questions uh, we get mo asked most frequently is how do we know exactly what EHC will do? And, and the answer of course is that we don't. The, there is evidence to suggest that it will result in the creation of more housing, greater diversity of housing and help ease housing price pressure, but uh, the demand for housing is very strong across Durham. It varies across time and across geography, street to street. So identifying the exact impacts in advance is very difficult to predict, so which is why we're completely committed and, and fully committed to carefully tracking and monitoring the impact of these provisions uh, if it's passed and reporting those back to you uh, within one year or with, the, with whatever periodicity you, you wish so that we can course correct and make sure it's meeting the intent that I described earlier or any goals that you all have for the initiative. Um, I'll, co I'll conclude with this. Everything proposed in this initiative is consistent with the goals of the 2005 comprehensive plan. Um, as part of that plan, it was anticipated that in order to ensure uh, that we uh, manage the cost of growth and that we uh, manage and minimize the cost of growth at the edges, which are very expensive in terms of new services and infrastructure, that approximately 15% of all growth would occur in the urban tier, totaling about 300 units per year. Um, in the past um, six years, since the end of the recession, uh, there's been an average of 95 new units um, produced in the urban tier, which is less than a third. About 5% of our new growth is going in the urban tier. Uh, and we need at least 15% of that growth to go in the urban tier to meet our 2005 comp plan uh, goals, which of course we're updating now. Uh, the urban tier, as you know, has our highest demand for housing. It has our highest opportunities neighborhoods and, and growth there is much more efficient in terms of public investment. Um, failure to grow at a reasonable rate of 15% will result in um, more infrastructure costs uh, and more service costs and the impacts on the environment by growing at the urban fringe. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions, and thank you for your time. Mr. Young, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, you have heard the report from staff, and now I'm going to uh, declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions uh, by members of the council for members of our staff. Questions for staff at this point. Councilmember Freeman. 
Uh, just some clarifying questions before. Um, so just noting the, I, I, I think I caught at the tail end, you were saying that there were be an uptick of 300 units added per year rather than 95 with this plan. And that prior to that, there was a goal that was set based on the previous comprehensive plan. And so what you're alluding to is that we failed to meet the goal. That's right. We never changed zoning following the 2005 comprehensive plan to match the future land use densities, which were um, six to 12 units in most of the urban tier and eight to 20 in some portions of the urban tier. And so we didn't meet our, our goal. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, Councilmember Freeman. We don't think it's reasonable to go to 300 units a year right away, and we don't think these provisions will result in that. We have a target of um, an additional 45 to 50 units to go to 140 units the next year, and then we'd like to see that increase maybe by 10 or 15% every year after that to eventually get to the 300. So we think that would happen over time as the market adjusts to these proposals. Um, it's unlikely that the types of proposals here would result in the scale of change that would get us to 300 in one or two years. And then just for, I mean, just for simplicity, if you could just lay out, because I felt like it was a jump and I missed it, exactly how does the increase of 300 units over four years we're talking about? So, Based on our 2005 comprehensive plan projections, we needed 300 units a year uh, to meet that 15% growth goal in the urban tier. So if we start with a goal of 140 units next year and that, that goal grows by 10%, within five or six years, we'll get to, um, we'll get to 300, near closer to 300 units and, and try to incrementally meet that goal. By the time this is fully implemented, we will likely have a new comprehensive plan recommended for you, and that we'll just kind of bake that in and reflect those changes going forward if this passes. And I, I, I highlight that because it's specific to the, for, to the premise that this will create affordable housing if we're increasing the number of units that are available and highlighting the fact that it's only 300. It means that we need to do a lot to make sure that we're engaging the development community to actually build because it's not gonna happen uh, without them. And so just noting that, there's also the point, the point I want to make, um, you pointed out the historical and structural racism aspects around redlining and the areas that you highlighted were in the blue and the green. Are those the only areas that, gonna, that are going to be impacted by this expanded housing choice? Are you making it specific to those areas or is it open to all across the city? Well, the, the largest impact would be in communities where the zoning currently allows only single family housing. Um, there are portions of the urban tier that were historically redlined that, that allow duplexes and multifamily housing today. So they'll be less impacted, but these provisions before you would apply across the urban tier, and then some of the provisions would be um, countywide if passed by the county and citywide if only passed by the city, such as the accessory dwelling unit provisions you heard about. Those, so would, be, wanna, those would be citywide. I just wanna make sure that we're careful in how we frame this, because what'll happen is that you only or the people who already live in the blue and the green areas, the funding sources that we're talking about and that have yet not yet been developed to actually do the accessory dwelling units when in fact those who might be in those red areas actually might need the funding as well. And so just making sure that that, that point is noted. And then you mentioned that the lot widths had the minimums had been removed. So that means that if I wanted to build two duplexes side by side, that would be allowed. So the, the lot widths have not been removed. The, in, the lot width infill standard has been removed. Let me explain the difference. Um, currently, we require that the existing lot widths on a street be considered when um, whether, looking at whether or not a home or a duplex can be developed there. So if you're on a street with large lot widths, um, your lot has to mirror or mimic those lot widths. What we're saying is we're going to allow everybody to have the minimum lot width, um, which um, is between 35 and 50 feet, depending on your zoning district. So that would allow for the creation of more lots. So we would just be allowing more lots, not more housing on the lots? Bo both. It would allow both. It would allow, um, in, mo in all districts, would allow a duplex un under these proposals. Um, and we are also recommending that accessory dwelling unit be able to be developed with the duplex. 
Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any other questions at this point? Uh, Council Member Austin. Um, hi, Pat. Could you explain the relationship? You mentioned briefly uh, the affordable housing density bonus. Could you explain the relationship between the density bonus and this proposal? Sure. Mike, would you come help me with that? Uh, the We've had an affordable housing density bonus in the ordinance for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and we've tweaked it and refined it to try to get it to be useful. Um, over over time, and we did that again with this provision. I'll let Michael describe exactly what we did um, as it applies to, to these uh, to these provisions. Thank you, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, so the affordable housing density bonus allows for additional reductions and uh, uh, relief in standards uh, to the base standards. So for changing the base standards, you're building upon additional. Uh, allowances for those who are implementing the affordable housing density bonus. So that's how the, the greatest impact is happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Great. All right. I want to thank. I Excuse me. Please don't yell out. Yeah, I, I, this, it, it, you, the, this is time for the council to ask questions of staff. And, and, and if I appreciate, I will ask staff to speak up in the future, okay? Thank you. Please don't, we need some more. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Stock, would you give your answer again, please? Absolutely, and I apologize for, for not communicating clearly. So the affordable housing density bonus allows for additional reductions to base zoning requirements. And thus, if you change the base zoning requirements or reduce them, those reductions carry on still would still apply. So if you're reducing, uh, so you have a small uh, house lot size and there's a minimum size there, and if you're reducing it, you still get to apply those additional reductions through the bonus. So there's a built upon additional incentive for doing the affordable housing density bonus. Thank you, Mr. Stock. Thank you. Thank you. So this is complicated. We've all got to accept the fact that this is complicated. <laughs> all right, friends, we're now about to, uh, I'm going to invite speakers up. I want to say a couple things. First of all, thank you all for your patience. It's been a long night already, and I want to appreciate you all for hanging in there. I know this, we've had some important discussions about uh, a report from our police chief and a and report about uh, crime and discussion about crime in our city and gun violence, and it's been important to have it. What you all are here for is also important. Um, I do want to stress that uh, although we, you can see that we don't always have civil comment, we do strive for civil comment, and I look forward to that on the part of everyone speaking tonight. Uh, we have more than 30 speakers, so I'm going to give each speaker two minutes. Uh, I'll call you in groups of four or five and ask you to come over here to my right. Uh, we'll go through all the speakers, and then uh, the council will have time for uh, questions and comment. And uh, then uh, we'll uh, take action. All right? And I guess one more thing I do want to say uh, is that uh, I really appreciate hearing from all of you all. Um, well, maybe not quite all of you all, but we've heard from a lot of people. <laughs> no, I mean, I really appreciate hearing from all of you all that I did hear from. Um, and very glad, very glad uh, to get the uh, very thoughtful ideas and uh, emails from everyone that we have received. Uh, and uh, in the last few days, we've gotten maybe 40 emails, and prior to that, we had many. Uh, and a lot of you all have been involved in discussions over time, and just want to thank you and appreciate everybody's participation in the process. It's been very valuable, and I know that it has uh, uh, certainly sharpened uh, this proposal and want to express my appreciation. All right, uh, we're going to, um, I'm going to ask uh, the first five people to please come over here to my right, Allison Shauger, um, Jim Anthony, Susan Sewell, Becky Winders, Marsha McNally, and Dick Hales. You all could please come to my right. 
Ms. Shogger, welcome. Uh, please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Sure, thanks for being here tonight. I'm Allison Shogger, 1528 North Duke Street. I'm a Trinity Park resident and also a board member of Bike Durham. As many of you know, Bike Durham is an all-volunteer, nonprofit coalition of individuals and organizations working on behalf of those who bike, walk, and take transit in Durham. Bike Durham consists of more than 230 supporting members, 1,300 newsletter subscribers, and approximately 4,000 social media followers. We are currently working to envision a low-stress network of bicycle facilities that allow people from eight years old to 80 years old to ride safely and comfortably to and from any destination in Durham. We believe that everyone should have access to safe and affordable transportation, regardless of race, wealth, gender identity, ability, or where they live. Affordable housing and safe, affordable transportation go hand in hand. We strongly urge council to approve the amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance as proposed in front of you tonight. By allowing increased quiet density to be built by right, we hope to see more and a wider variety of people living within walking distance and biking distance of transit, jobs, and goods and services, rather than displacing people further from downtown in order to find housing affordability. We are particularly pleased to see that the specific proposed changes to EHC incorporate the recommendations of the Neighbors for Housing Equity Coalition, who conducted significant outreach in neighborhoods and with, most, and with people most impacted by a lack of affordable housing. Please vote tonight to pass this item. If we wait for perfect solutions to every complex interrelated issue, then we do nothing while the problem of affordability only gets worse. Let's pass expanding housing choices and next, start to work on the affordable transportation bond, building a connected network of low-stress bike lanes, and funding more sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shogger. Uh, we'll now hear from Mr. Jim Anthony. Mr. Anthony, welcome, uh, and please uh, give us your name and address. You have two minutes. My name's James Anthony. I am, um, I live in, Dur in Raleigh. Uh, however, my address there is 1201 Edwards Mill Road. Tonight, Durham has the opportunity to lead not just the Triangle and North Carolina, but the entire nation by passing this Expanding Housing Choices Amendment. It is bold, it's visionary, and it is going to result in real change. I represent the development community, and I appreciate the comments from the council earlier about the vital importance of our engagement in this process of delivering affordable housing solutions in our community. Most of the contents of the EHC was in the affordable housing toolbox developed in 2016 by a group convened by the White House, the Obama White House. I support the EHC amendment and the visionary work of the planning department who truly busted their fannies to get this thing done and the many coalition groups that exist in this community to support affordable housing from many different perspectives. I also want to go on record as stating that the development community of which I'm a part supports the affordable housing bond, which is vital to creating the public-private partnerships, the land banks, and the other tools that are needed to finance the expansion of affordable housing. And it can be done in a sustainable way. I also urge you to go bolder. Beyond just land banking property, deploy it. Get it to use as quickly as you can. Pursuing public-private partnerships and expanding the boundaries into the suburban tiers. Mr. Anthony, thank you, thank you very much. We'll now hear from Susan Sewell. Ms. Sewell, Hi. welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. My name is Susan Sewell, and I live at 2904 Legion Avenue in Durham. I speak tonight on behalf of Tuscaloosa Lakewood Neighborhood Association. TLNA strongly agrees with Durham's goals of equitable growth, affordable housing, increased density in the urban tier and other areas, and neighborhood diversity. However, we doubt that expanding housing choices alone will lead to any growth towards these goals. 
After several months of study, almost the entire Planning Commission agreed and asked you to slow down on this proposal until other parts could be added to it. Most other cities cited as examples of this kind of upzoning have rezoned as part of a full quiver of changes that helped make new building options available more equitably. They also rezoned their entire county. EHC increases pressures on only the donut around downtown and provides no relief from the market forces that will continue to push large single family homes. Our growth would continue to be at the expense of the most vulnerable people and some of our oldest neighborhoods. We expect better from Durham. We advocate for a comprehensive set of programs to address the multiple actors in our current situation. For instance, programs that would provide access to designers, contractors, and capital so that small homeowners can repair their own homes and build rental units on, some, on their own lots. This would preserve some of our heritage, add density, and spread the benefits of Durham's growth more broadly. We oppose expanding housing choices at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sewell. Ms. Ms. Wanders. Mr. Hales, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two minutes. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council. My name is Dick Hales, 100 Briarcliff Road in Durham. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. The Coalition is a volunteer group of Durham citizens and organizations that work to support policies, programs, and projects that provide safe, affordable shelter for all residents of our community with good access to transit. You've just received an excellent staff report and presentation covering the extensive community input process carried out in reviewing these draft changes. Coalition speakers tonight will try not to repeat much of that information, but will instead focus on what we feel are the most critical EHC issues. After much input, participation, study, and debate, the coalition voted on July 15th to support adoption of the March version of the EHC which is the majority of what's in front of you tonight. We also believe one additional major concern needs to be addressed as well. This concern is that by encouraging development of more ADUs, duplexes, and flag lot housing, the EHC could add to the gentrification and displacement in some Durham neighborhoods. That's why we support the following five actions be taken immediately following EHC adoption as safeguards to discourage displacement and as ways to encourage more small-scale compatible infill housing. Number one, coalition strongly recommends that the EHC changes be initially focused on production of additional affordable housing units and implemented in a way that will counter the gentrification and displacement of existing residents. To help achieve this result, there should be at least a 12-month delay in the effective date of the EHC changes, with an exception and additional steps outlined below. Number two, as an exception to the 12-month delay in implementation, we urge that the EHC provisions be allowed to be used immediately upon adoption when new affordable housing unit is being created. Thank uh, you, offer a head start for nonprofit providers of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hales. Ms. McNally, welcome. Uh, please give us your name and address. You have two minutes. My name is Marsha McNally. I live at 203 North Church Street. I'm continuing with the coalition's um, five points. <clears throat> the third point is that we um, strongly urge the council to direct staff to have a technical assistance program as well as a program for financial assistance for homeowners considering to do duplexes, flag lots, and so on partly so that they, uh, if they need help figuring out how to do it, or uh, be, if they are willing to commit to adding an affordable unit, that they would do so. Um, fourth, we would like to add some uh, considerations to what's been proposed, and primarily it focuses on uh, revising the num maximum number of unrelated uh, individuals who occupy a house from currently three to either four or five uh, people which would um, allow more households and persons in um, infill housing. And that the requirement for the number of years of afford affordability for new homeowners could be reviewed um, with our nonprofit community to figure out what works best. And this, uh, you already, or Pat Young already spoke about, but number five, 
uh, recommend that the city staff monitor to make sure that we actually are getting what we're paying for with the EHC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Wanders, welcome. You have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Becky Winders, and I live at 4 Glenmore Drive, and I'm also speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. Uh, as Dick said, we endorsed a, a position in July uh, to, um, uh, to support EHC and to, and to recommend some additional um, uh, actions. Uh, but since that time, the, uh, the proposal has continued to uh, evolve, and we have some additional comments about the most recent changes. First, we, 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 uh, the, the EHC language has changed to, made some small changes on building heights and allowing ADUs and duplexes in more places. And we see this as, as, as these as being minor and will mostly remove barriers and, and uh, we support those changes. Uh, we also feel uh, uh, that we have not taken a position on the question of whether or not a historic district should be, local historic districts should be exempt, exempted and we are encouraging you to, to, we support the EHC with or without the exemption of historic districts. Uh, we also uh, support investigations into modifying development standards to support higher density development in appropriate locations in the suburban tier. So to, to, um, in summary, the, the coalition believes that there are many good reasons to pass the EHC with the, the additions that we have suggested. And one of those is to, uh, you have your um, uh, resolutions and, um, in your agenda do not include a delay of the start date. And we're suggesting a, a delay of the start date the default is to start in a month or something, you know. We want to delay the, the, the start date to allow some of these other things to be added on to it. Thank you, Ms. Winders. Oh, uh, I'm going to ask now another group of five to please come to my right. First, we'll have Mimi Kessler. Second, we'll have Ellen Pless. Then we'll have Pella Jareffi, Linda Wilson, and Michael Schwartz. If you all could please come to my right. <clears throat> and we'll start with Ms. Kessler. No need to run. You're in good, you're, you're, we're, we're moving along at a good pace, but uh, you don't need to go that fast. So Thank you. I appreciate Kessler, that. Welcome. Uh, you have two minutes. Um, my name is Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive. This is a very divisive issue. It has uh, divided many people in all of the neighborhoods across the city. And I want to say that it would be fine with me for every house on my street to have persons of color, every religion of the world, and every ethnicity of the world. I would like for there to be diversity across the city and not drive out those not making a living wage. But I'm not fine with taking uh, the small lot definition is 25 feet wide. My lot is 50 feet wide. According to the language, as I understand it, my lot could be divided in half lengthwise, two duplexes and two ADUs. So that replaces one dwelling with six. That's not incremental. I'm all for incremental. We hammered out a compromise with the Planning Commission and it disturbs me that it's not being adequately thought about. A lot of what the Coalition for Affordable Housing is good Delay it. We need people who will uh, help fund ADUs in the in the um, sections of town, which really could benefit from it. But and I'm all for duplex by right, but not taking lots and dividing them and then doing a six-fold increase is just not incremental. And I don't think that we have information um, that if we were to do that, we don't have an environmental impact study. Um, the, apparently, apartments don't count in the counting of dwellings. I don't really understand that. Um, and uh, ADUs don't count as dwellings, even though dwelling is part of the name. So I think there's a lot of things that still need to get hammered out about this, and I urge you not to pass this tonight. Thank you, Ms. Kessler. Uh, we'll now hear from Ms. Press. 
Yes, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Ellen Pless, welcome. Yes, hello, my name's Ellen Pless. I live at 706 East Forest Hills Boulevard. Thank you for letting me speak. I ask each of you to please vote no on the EHC in all of its shifting forms. And I'd like to take a moment to discuss some numbers with you. 13 people per day moving to Durham. That is the actual number of people who arrive in Durham County instead of 20 the seemingly unsubstantiated number you and the planning department have been pushing to the media and the public for many months heading up to this point. One city misled into thinking that it is growing much faster than it really is. Its sense of reality warped by the pervasive 20 per day message. 105 days since I asked for your assistance in correcting the daily growth figure and communicating it to the public and the media so that Durham might have a more accurate sense of itself and its image and its needs. 15 rushed months to develop and sell EHC. 48 months for Minneapolis to study and consider the ramifications of their plan. One confusing name, expanding housing choices, rather than being clearly named what it is, an upzoning. Zero paper notices mailed by the US Postal Service to property owners. Zero notices included with utility billing statements. Zero amendment signs erected by the planning department within impacted communities. One formative practitioners panel comprised of potential beneficiaries and profit makers with zero normal citizen stakeholders at the table. Zero protections for national historic districts with multiple incentives for teardowns. Two NPOs severely altered without their representatives being at the practitioner's panel. One prioritized NPO application severely delayed. Zero environmental impact statement. Zero. Thank you, Ms. Press. Friends? Ms. Jureffi, Ms. Jureffi, yes. before you start, let me just say, you have written me two great emails, which I have not answered, and I apologize. I've answered a lot of emails on this, but I haven't answered yours, and I apologize to you. But good, you, you didn't need to, apolo good, you know, to good, apologize. Good. I just sent it so you will have the information. No, I, I'm sorry I didn't. You, good to have you here, and you okay. have two minutes. Okay. My name is Bella Jureffi, and I live in 1008 Monmouth Avenue. I live in Durham for 40 years. And ironically, I work with former city councils for rezoning so that we can preserve the beauty of Durham and its homes and its trees. I worked for the tree committee for a couple of decades that Mark Rogers started. I work as well on the truck routes so the trucks will not go following our neighborhoods because that's the way it was in 1980 and before. Most of those homes that a lot of people lived in that are some of them historical, we basically refurbished them, most of us ourselves, because at that time we really didn't have any money. Not that we have any more now, but we really did not have. We had children to support, etc. So I worked for this Durham Public Schools for 25 years. Every single day I went to school as a volunteer. So I really do love Durham. Unfortunately, this February, I heard from a neighbor what was going on about this EHC. I've never heard before, and Steve will know, I'm really involved in Durham, and I've never heard anything. So I really was surprised to hear that Durham had worked for a year with some developers on rezoning mixing it with affordability. I will tell you the affordability does not exist. There was a house in my block that was turned into a house with a grandmother uh, or mother-in-law, whatever. They rent every single room for $2,000. That's not affordability and that's not what's gonna happen, especially in some areas where the new people are coming. So. I beg you not to pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reffey. <laughs> Linda Wilson. Linda Wilson. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Wilson, welcome. 
And uh, you also have two minutes. And, and I also did not get a response to my email, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Nor an apology. I apologize Just to you, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> so my name uh, but, is we did, but we did meet in person. We did do that. Yes, we did, in my office. Yes. Thank you. Right. Uh, my name is Linda Wilson, and I live at 302 Watts Street, which is the original Watts Hospital. Um, I have this terrible feeling of de deja vu tonight, because most of us sitting in this room have been in this room on and off for the last six or eight months trying to figure out how to do this EHC. Um, I know that you all have gotten a list of our concerns, and I won't repeat them here, but I do have um, just a few things I'd like to mention and ask you not to pass this um, project until you've addressed these concerns. Some of these have already been mentioned, but I'm going to go over them very quickly. We really need an environmental impact study. We are talking about tripling the number of units in a neighborhood. Tripling. We need a study. Uh, we need a correct... The, Corrected population growth estimates, the estimates from the planning department do not match the state's estimates. Uh, in some year, year groups, they group it at 10-year groups, um, in some cases there's a 25% disparity. So we need the planning department to look at that really carefully. Uh, we need an assessment, uh, a 20-year assessment of public safety needs. I wish the police chief were still here. I'd like to know how many additional police officers we're going to need to cover this tripling in population. Uh, we need an assessment of a 20-year assessment of water and sewer ne ne bleh, sorry, needs. In my neighborhood, we cross our fingers that our streets won't explode when there's a heavy rain. And they did explode in my basement some years ago because the, the sewage system was not adequate to take care of the, uh, the rain. Uh, we need a 20-year assessment of what our public schools are going to need to look like. None of this, as far as I know, none of this has been done. I would go back to zero. Uh, and we need an assessment tool for the EHG itself so that when it does go into effect, and I know that eventually some version of it will, when it goes into effect, we need to be able to evaluate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, my name is Michael Schwartz. I live at 1011 West Knox in Trinity Park. Um, and you're hearing a lot tonight about things that could happen um, if this passes. And um, as the director said, we don't know everything that will happen. Um, but there is one scenario where we definitely know what will happen, and that's if we do nothing. And this affordability crisis will just go on as it's been going on. I moved here from Oakland, California, about two years ago and they can provide a cautionary tale of what happens when there's inaction. There I watched over 10 years as the middle class evaporated, as housing costs rose, and the lower income families got squeezed and eventually displaced, not out of the city, but out of the region. This proposal represents a solid piece of legislation and is clearly just the first step in a long fight to preserve affordability in Durham. As a transportation planner, I'm pleased that this proposal addresses the racist policy of single-family zoning, which is a shameful legacy of my profession. I urge you to pass this legislation as proposed, and let's move on to the many other pieces in this complex puzzle. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I'm going to now call the next group of five, and if you all could uh, come over to my right as well. Uh, first will be Nick Doty. Second will be Jamie Greener, Dan Bach, Dan Reed, and Barbara Bratz. And uh, Mr. Doty, welcome. Uh, we'll begin with you. Uh, please give us your name and address. You have two minutes. Sure. Uh, my name is Nick Doty. I live at 300 Blackwell Street. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council members, for staying late talking with us. Um, I think you've heard a lot already from staff and from some others here about affordability. I think it's important for you to also look at the comments from your Environmental Affairs Board. Um, they gave detailed comments on the expanding housing choices, and this is a, this is a great opportunity where affordability and uh, environmental sustainability go hand in hand. So, uh, infill development, um, having more people living in the urban tier um, 
makes it easier for people to walk to work or walk to restaurants, to bike around, to take public transit. Um, those are vitally important things, um, especially given the urgent needs around climate change. So I, I would encourage you to support the proposal based on those recommendations from your Environmental Affairs Board. Uh, and I would also have you look at the comments from your Environmental Affairs Board about uh, parking minimums, which uh, they and I were frustrated, did not, um, <laughs> were not reduced as part of expanding housing choices. Um, building that extra uh, parking garage uh, makes housing much more expensive. Um, and it also uh, locks us in for years or decades uh, by sustaining, by <clears throat> subsidizing uh, car usage, subsidizing fossil fuel production. Um, yeah, so I, I, again, uh, affordability and environmental sustainability will go the same way. If we build housing for people and not housing for cars, <laughs> then our housing can go much further. So I'd encourage you to support this proposal and also go further in talking about reducing parking minimums. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doty. <laughs> we'll now hear from Jamie Greener. Mr. Greener, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts tonight. My name is Jamie Greener. I live at 2410 West Club Boulevard in Watts Hillendale. I am a member of the Watts Hospital Hillendale Neighborhood Association. Um, but to be clear, I am speaking tonight for myself as a private citizen and not a member of the WHHNA. My views are my own. Uh, many of who have spoken before me and who will speak after me have gone into the weeds of the EHC, weeds about the details of height and width and setbacks and square footage, weeds about developers, weeds about the threat of teardowns. I'm not here to talk about the weeds. I'm here to talk about the garden that is the city of Durham. People are coming from all over to plant their roots in our garden. The city center is growing and thriving, and folks want to live near it. Let's make room for them. Let's let more Duramites, whether they be recent transplants or old growth, live in our garden. City Council, plant the seeds that will provide homes for those who want to live here and share in our bounty. Pass an EHC that permits duplexes throughout the urban tier. Pass an EHC that reduces the pole width for flag lots. Pass an EHC that allows ADUs up to 800 square feet everywhere ADUs are allowed. Let Durhamites define for themselves what is a family. Rise above the weeds, plant the seeds, and water our garden with the EHC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greener. Uh, Mr. Bach, welcome. You also have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Bach. I live at 915 Urban Ave. Uh, I am here to speak in support of expanding housing choices. Uh, we have a quantity problem. There's a lot of things that are complicated about uh, land, land use planning, but there are some things that are very simple, such as there are more people who want to live in Durham than we have housing units for, uh, and there are, there are more people who want to live in the urban tier um, than there are housing units. Um, I wanted to address one uh, thing that I, I heard recently, an idea to uh, limit the uh, EHC options to affordable housing only, uh, whether permanently or for a period of one year. Um, my concern with that idea would be we don't want to create a choice where someone can build a single family home with no strings attached, or they could build a duplex or an 800 square foot ADU uh, if they but they have to jump through some hoops and they have to qualify for affordable housing and they probably have to forego some rental income. And I, I worry that uh, if that's what the choice is, then um, you end up with a lot of people who decide to skip the headaches and um, build a single family home. Uh, we shouldn't make it hard to build duplexes and ADUs while making it easy to build single family homes. Um, um, the last thing I want to address is the, uh, the resident survey, the 2018 Durham resident survey. 60% uh, of respondents thought adequate supply of housing uh, should be an important priority for the city. Uh, and we have a, a, a small group that shows up to these public hearings and, um, and, and is a self-selected group that is not necessarily representative of the city. So the, um, the resident survey is a valuable tool for um, for engaging that. The message is clear. People want more housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Um, I'm not sure Dan Reed is here. Is Dan here? He's here. All right. Uh, 
Are you Ms. Ms. Bratz? Yes. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Barbara Bratz, 1918 Wilshire Drive. Um, I urge you to vote against this proposal. I really fear that it will have um, severe unintended consequences, particularly, I don't see how it um, helps with affordability. I urge you to um, tackle that problem in a more comprehensive way. I think that this um, proposal needs to be part of the um, comprehensive plan, which I understand maybe has already started, um, but it seems a little bit like putting the cart before the horse. I really fear about environmental degradation as a result of that. Um, I've heard um, concerns over um, or, or uh, support for this proposal because of um, access to um, or reduced trans uh, transport problems, um, people walking, biking, busing to work, you know, closer to jobs. But I know in my own part of the neighborhood, nobody walks to work, nobody bikes to work. Um, my own property could be replaced uh, with one house with six dwelling units. That's one car to six to 12 cars. So um, we're looking at perhaps a 12-fold increase in automobiles on my street um, because there is no public transportation. And my understanding is that um, buses are banned from University Drive. So I, I don't see how this improves the transport problem. Um, so I urge you to um, consider other ways to address affordable housing um, in a more comprehensive way with other issues like transport um, and environmental considerations within the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bratz. I'm now going to call the uh, next group of people. Uh, and if you could come over to my right. I believe this name is Lorand Matori, and I expect I've got that wrong, and I apologize if I have. Uh, Robert Chapman, John Swansea, uh, Rand Baron, and Stacy Murphy. If you all could please come over here to my right, I would appreciate it. And uh, first, I'm going to welcome Mr. Matori. Thank you. Yes. And you uh, have, you can tell me what your name actually is. J. Lorand Matori. All right. Apologies. And uh, right. welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. James Lorand Matori, 1014 West Markham Avenue. And I salute this democracy and your patience and listening very fully and carefully to our thoughts. I really do appreciate it, and I appreciate your giving your thoughts. Um, I've lived in Trinity Park for just over 10 years, over a decade, and I'm sympathetic to the uh, official concerns of the EHC. I like living in a diverse neighborhood and wish that Trinity Park were more diverse. Um, what is a diverse neighborhood? To me, it's where people of different races, religions, national origins, stages of life, and classes have the opportunity to rent or to buy. And we should all feel safe in such a neighborhood as well, so that we can learn from each other, break bread together, share with each other. I admit I did not feel safe when one of my neighbors displayed a Confederate flag on the streets that we must share, but fortunately most of my neighbors objected and denounced his, his communication of unwelcome to people like me. A diverse neighborhood should and can also be healthy, with plenty of trees, with sufficient parking, with adequate systems of sewage, water supply, and, drain st and storm drainage. Trinity Park has the makings of all of the above, which is why we chose it as our home. Its virtues include houses of remarkably diverse sizes, numerous apartment buildings. It was clearly not zoned for single family only. There are many high-rise apartment buildings in our neighborhood and 70% of our units are rental units. Given market trends, I must admit, it is becoming harder for moderate income or young people to buy or rent in Trinity Park. But sadly, it's not obvious to me that the current proposal will reverse or stop that trend. In fact, it's likely to increase the commercial value of our properties and both encourage the replacement of small houses with big ones, which no moderate income person could afford, and to encourage also the dividing up of lots that will generate up to six units. Oh, that's two minutes. Up to six units. It goes fast. Too much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Um, and now uh, we will hear from uh, Mr. Robert Chapman. Mr. Chapman, welcome. Uh, you have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'm coming before you to su strongly support EHC. I live at 2525 Lanier Place in Durham. The zoning for my lot is RS20, which means a minimum 20,000 square foot lot. Whoever thought that up uh, wasn't thinking very clearly. We sort of feel in our neighborhood that we only get together um, after ice storms or hurricanes. We might get to see each other if a tree goes down uh, in the next few days. Um, I'm a new urbanist developer. Um, I believe in walkable urbanism. I believe in uh, places, building places that people love. I love Trinity Park. Um, if you look at Durham's zoning code uh, that was in effect when Trinity Park was built, it was 16 pages long, and the density was 70 families per acre. We, we've come a, come a long way from that. Our zoning code and all of the related documents, the standards and the overlays and so forth, is now 1,000 times longer, 1,600 pages. Uh, and we haven't had it been heading in the right direction. I think we've been heading in the direction of addressing our fear. And I think we need to move toward what we had before, which is places where lots of people could afford to live. Of the 80 ADUs in Durham, I actually was responsible for building about 40% of them over in Trinity Heights. Everyone who built one of those paid for three-fourths of their mortgage payment from the rent, which was also a, pretty, a fairly affordable rate, um, and it created affordable housing for everyone. I'd like to see us move back toward building places that people love. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Swansea. Thank you. Please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Good evening. John Swansea from 110 North Buchanan uh, in Trinity Park. Um, there are lots of things in the uh, EHC that I do like. Um, my street already has duplexes, fourplexes, sixplexes, uh, apartment buildings, more of the units are in multifamily than they are in single family. Some of the things in the, AD, in the EHC are thoughtful and progressive and I support them. The use of ADUs, duplex on full size lots, respectful infill, uh, small houses on non-conforming lots, and I also support the affordable housing bond and project. But the EHC has what I see as a time bomb in it. You've heard it mentioned by multiple people before, and it's the one into six provision. You didn't see any pictures of that when they showed it. They didn't mention Nashville or Houston in the cities that they studied. Because if you Google Nashville skinny houses or Houston skinny houses, you'll see the nightmare that potentially could happen in Durham, where uh, this EHC will create new incentives for aggressive teardowns, Displacement, displacement, gentrification, and the replacement of single historic houses with cookie cutter luxury boxes. If you look downtown, you can see when a developer figures out the magic formula that's the most profitable, it's repeated over and over and over again as fast as possible. And by the time anyone realizes what happened, it would be too late. You could have lot by lot, street by lot, street by street of historic modest homes displaced. The other thing that's a problem with this is it will result in the transfer of ownership from lower income homeowners to the investor class. If these six unit buildings are not being built by the homeowners, it will be the investors. Thank you, Mr. Swansea. Our next, our next speaker is Ron Baron. Van Baron, 208 North Driver Street. You have two minutes. Thank you. I won't belabor the many points made by my fellow proponents, except to briefly say what you sitting up there all already know. Single-family zoning is, and always has been, an ugly tool of racist policy. 
Oasis tool cannot be wielded for good. It must be discarded on the trash heap of, of history. We cannot claim to be anti-racist while we, using a policy that replaced redlining as a tool of white segregationists. Having said that, I want to talk about something else. I've heard so many bemoaning the process by which EHC was arrived at. I've attempted to be engaged every step of, step of this process, from neighborhood meetings to planning commission meetings. I've been active online and even attended the tiny planning subcommittee meeting. Throughout all this, the loudest voices have always been middle and upper middle class white folks from wealthy neighborhoods. For them to cry out that they were not heard is the height of absurdity and the epitome of white privilege. I am confident that this excellent item will be approved tonight. In considering future land use policy, I urge you to continue to develop a process of equitable engagement, to set to, not to center the loudest and whitest voices, but to continue to engage with and learn from anti-racist and anti-class practice, and to privilege those voices to least able to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy Murphy. Please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. My name is Stacy Murphy, and I live at 1014 Demeria Street in Trinity Park. Um, I'm a small business owner who does historic renovation on smaller homes, and I own a handful of rental properties in the urban tier. Um, I'm passionate about Durham, and I'm active in the affordable housing um, space through volunteer efforts that I do uh, with Habitat for Humanity. I work with Families Moving Forward, and I also have personal rental units that I, that I rent below market rate. Um, I've been active in uh, these discussions for over nine months now, as uh, originally as a member of the Trinity Park, Avenue, uh, Trinity Park Neighborhood Association Board, but I come here today just speaking for myself, my own personal opinions. Um, I urge the council to please uh, vote to pass expanding housing solutions. Um, I believe that uh, EHC removes the exclusionary single family zoning practices and policies that were adopted in this city and in my neighborhood around the same time that 147 was built. That's the same time that the Haytide community was destroyed and there were hundreds of African American families and poor families that were displaced by that construction. At that time, um, that's when we saw all the single family zoning policies come into effect. It was also about the same time in history that the Fair Zoning Act, um, the Fair Housing Act went into effect and um, racial discrimination in housing was officially outlawed. So um, single family zoning practices are at best exclusionary, but realistically they're, they're pretty racist. And I think it's time that we recognize that as a community, we take the progressive action and stand up against single um, family zoning policies. Um, in addition, if EHC is passed, I do believe that affordable housing units will be built. I'm part of a coalition, coalition of neighbors who are working hard to um, partner with nonprofits to build ADUs for making real low cost affordable housing solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going to call the next group of uh, speakers. If you'll come to my right, Scott Herman, <coughs> Larissa Seibel, happy birthday, Miss Seibel, oh. Oh. Mary Barzee, Rhino Rachel Galper, Galper, and Ideal Ortiz. If you all could please come to my right, and we'll begin with Mr. Harmon. Mr. Harmon, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. Scott Harmon, 600 West Main Street. When I was born, my parents were on the low end of the middle class. Their wealth and economic status grew mostly through home ownership. When my mom died in 2005, I inherited what was left of her IRA and invested it in downtown real estate, which advanced my career as an architect and real estate developer. This is the American dream. Work hard and pass wealth down to your kids. Every system in this country is designed to help me reach that dream, the education system, healthcare system, and especially real estate. I didn't ask for these advantages. I didn't have to. These systems are designed to help me thrive. Privilege is a good thing until we realize that not everyone has access to it. That same estate, real estate system that helped me is an obstacle to people who don't look like me or whose parents weren't allowed to buy homes in the same neighborhoods that my parents did. Our zoning system is unfair. We continue to segregate our neighborhoods by economic status and pretend that these rules have nothing to do with race and class, 
despite four centuries of history that prove otherwise, 1619. Our zoning system is unsustainable. Density is not the enemy, it is the solution. Our zoning system is not progressive. What if we threw out the entire ordinance, started over, and asked our new generation of planning professionals to design an ordinance that was fair, sustainable, and provided plentiful and affordable housing? I promise you such a system would look nothing like the one we have now. No individual in this room is to blame for our broken zoning system. We inherited it from our parents who inherited it from theirs. That's what makes systemic injustice so hard for me to see as a white person. When the world is designed to make life easy for me without my having to think about it, it's hard to believe there's anything wrong. It's hard to give up these advantages, this privilege. But surely we can share our privilege with others. We can learn to see it, leverage it, and make sure we're not asking the entire community to carry the burden of our personal comfort and affluence. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. Ms. Seibel, welcome, and you have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Larissa Seibel, and I'm a member of the Durham People's Alliance Housing Action Team. There's still a few of us left. We support expanding housing choices as an affordable housing density bonus that will make a significant difference in Durham. Using expanding housing choices as an affordable housing density bonus is an effective way to reduce displacement of lower income residents. California found that building affordable housing was twice as effective as just increasing density in reducing displacement. You need to build affordable homes in addition to eliminating single family zoning. So expanding housing choices has the potential to push the market towards building affordable homes for low and moderate income residents. But for it to work, the city must create new financing programs so low and moderate income residents can build, buy, and rent affordable homes themselves and with nonprofit and for profit builders. This will take time. For several months, the planning commissioners and staff, housing groups, and community members talked with each other. These conversations informed the planning commission's consensus recommendations. They agreed that expanding housing choices should be used as an affordable housing density bonus until the city creates programs that are effective in ensuring equal access to affordable housing in Durham. We encourage the city to continue to meet with all who want to build equity in housing as we expand affordable housing for all. Tonight, the city council can begin to bend the arc of the housing market in Durham by making expanding housing choices a big, bold, affordable housing program. Thank Mr. you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Mayor, if I could just, also just, just saying thank you for your service also as a former council member, and then happy birthday. <laughs> thank you for that important reminder, council member. You're right. Yes, welcome. Nice to have another council member in our chamber. Uh, Mary Barzi. Ms. Barzi, welcome. And uh, please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Barzi. I live at 1014 Onslow Street in Walltown. I've lived in the neighborhood for 15 years. Um, in response to somebody else, my kids and I uh, rode our bikes to school this morning, and I carpooled to work and then walked home. So some of us are taking advantage of that walkable, bikeable neighborhood. Um, I have a personal interest in the EHC because I've been interested in building an ADU on my backyard um, for some time. Uh, like many people in my so-called sandwich generation, our family is raising small children while helping to support and eventually more extensively care for our elderly and partially disabled family members. We first approached the planning department to get clarity about our options for building an ADU in 2010. Our neighborhood is zoned to allow duplexes and ADUs, but it was then that we learned that our home was too small at a little over 1,200 square feet to be able to build an ADU under the current main house ratio restrictions. I'll cut to the chase. I enthusiastically support the EHC because of its thoughtful quality of life and cost of living solutions. Also with us um, being allowed under the new EHC proposals, to build an 800 square foot ADU. Um, that would allow us to get um, ex the accessibility um, needs met 
that we have. Um, and we would no longer have that too small house issue. Um, Multi-generational living is not just a cultural practice honored in Africa, Europe, Asia, and Central America. It is an economic solution that should be valued and supported here in Durham. I'm pleased to see that there are no additional parking requirements mandated, as the beauty of living near downtown is its walkability and bikeability. Thank you, Ms. Barcy. Um, Ms. Galper here. All right, then uh, we'll go to Ideal Ortiz. Ms. Ortiz, welcome, and you have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Ideal Ortiz. I live at 1808 Vale Street. I've been there since 2003, and I just want to remind people in this room that there are black and brown homeowners. There are black and brown contractors. There are black and brown real estate agents. And when they have the right policy conditions, these folks also benefit and spread that wealth to their families and to their community. I just wanna remind that our community did not arrive at the present moment of gentrification and unequal access to housing by mysterious fair market forces. We arrived here because of laser precise and intentional local policies that were designed to make sure black and brown residents did not move into certain parts of town. The market currently makes what the policies make easy to produce. Right now, it encourages expensive single family homes in about 40 some odd percent of our inner um, city. As a longtime community advocate in my neighborhood and throughout Durham on a variety of issues, I've been diligent to sit with people who are deeply impacted by the lack of affordable housing. And not one of them has objected to the idea of allowing more ADUs or duplexes throughout Durham. In fact, they're surprised that anyone else is concerned for them on this point. Um, they do not have any negative opinions about such type of housing. The one thing low income people did mention was missing from these policies is a removal of the current rules uh, about how many unrelated people can live together in one dwelling. We are in a moment in Durham, as are many cities, where we are reckoning with the racist roots of our local zoning policies, and the historical evidence is clear. The rules regarding restrictions on certain modest housing types and promoting the single family home with a large yard was a creative policy manifestation in the wake of the Fair Housing Act when race could no longer be used in local policy around housing. So single family zoning was created to maintain <coughs> neighborhoods as white as possible. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. So um, now um, I'm going to call five more names. If you could please come to my right. Tiffany Elder, <coughs> Rob Levinsky, Christian Santiago, King Kenny, and Sam Gunter. And we'll begin with, with Ms. Elder. Welcome, Ms. Elder. Please give us your name and address. You have two minutes. Uh, my name's Tiffany Elder. I'm at 3509 Rodden. I'm a realtor, general contractor, and small-scale developer, rental property owner in Durham, and I'm here as an individual and as a representative of the collective, which is a cohort of minority real estate professionals spanning realtors, appraisers, landlords, property managers, developers, lenders, and others who serve the Durham real estate community. A few of them are in the back. You'll hear from some of them later. We are committed to ensuring the viability of our real estate communities, and we fully support EHC. Uh, to give you a real world example, minute and a half, uh, as a landlord, I own properties across a broad rental range, the, the very lowest of which is $850 a month. Uh, that's below market rent in an area that currently rents for $1,200 a month for a comparable home. And I've kept the rent low because my tenant, who is an elderly female on fixed income, has been in place for six years. I know she can't afford a large increase. I don't receive any subsidies for providing housing, and despite this being my bread and butter, I've made an, an intentional decision as a responsible landlord to balance it out across my portfolio uh, so that I can keep a good tenant who needs a good home in place. I do this because I believe this is how communities are created. Unfortunately, as property taxes continue to rise, I may be forced to increase and potentially lose this tenant. And a similar situation happened on another property of mine in the West End when overnight the property taxes went from $1,400 a year to $4,400 a year, which is $250 a month. And unfortunately, I was not able to keep my longstanding tenants in that home. So I share these examples with you because EHC can positively impact my ability to continue to provide a range of housing in our city 
Both properties that I mentioned have very large yards that neither tenants even use, and per EHC, I'd be able to leverage the yard space to build a reasonably sized ADU or, sub or subdivide the existing lots to create a small second home, and the additional cash flow would allow me to continue to provide housing to a broad range of tenants in our community. So EHC can create housing opportunities for both buyers and tenants in Durham across price ranges. I applaud you for your work on this, and I urge you to vote yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Adler. Rob Levinsky. Mr. Levinsky, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a new resident of, as of last October to Durham. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to live in such a beautiful community uh, and to address you tonight. Um, I think that I come from, uh, lived in several different places in my life. I grew up in Boston, uh, then lived in Sonoma County, California, uh, and then um, in Asbury Park, New Jersey, a revitalizing community on the Jersey Shore before coming here. And I think one thing that's very important in my experience but living in all of them is the decisions you make in planning and zoning affect the entire quality of life for people now and for future generations. The key, more than anything else, is not to have urban sprawl. When you have that, you have a lower quality of life for everyone. You have more traffic, you have more pollution, you have less open space. Uh, you have a, uh, if you look at places that have had Poor zoning, say, and I don't mean to knock anyone else, but other cities, that new cities that haven't done a good job of that, um, the results have been disastrous. So as a general rule, I support what is being proposed here because I think good, sensible, thoughtful infill makes communities more vital, uh, more livable, and a higher quality. I would add, however, one caveat that one gentleman mentioned that I think is very, very important um, in this process and that is not to have a teardown of existing homes. There's a difference between adding to an existing lot as you're proposing, a second unit, a guest unit, uh, to have infill, that's great. But when you tear down old existing homes, historic homes, you change the quality of life forever. I've seen cities where well-intended people did that, and the gentleman's right, Nashville, Seattle being another, and suddenly, you had a, a massive amount of very ugly development and a quality of life that was destroyed. So I support the proposal as a whole. I don't know the details, and when I don't know, I try not to speak to pontificate on something. I'd simply say, go forward with it, but don't tear down existing properties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levinsky. Uh, we'll hear from Mr. Mr. Christian Santiago. Mr. Santiago, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Christian Santiago. I live at 300 Blackball Street. I would like to say, first of all, that I am from Tampa, Florida, and I just graduated Duke in December, and Durham's character is what kept me here in Durham. I really want to make this my, my home. I want to build my career here, and I just love this city, and this is why I came out to speak tonight in support of today's proposal. To me, uh, first of all, I'd like to say the, that the affordable housing bond, I can really appreciate that it works in conjunction with EAC, and I would hope that you guys maintain being intentional about using that money in order to support this um, proposal as well. But to me, density means sustainability, but more importantly, density means community. And if we are limiting who can move into our community, we are in effect limiting our character. And this is exactly why I moved to Durham, it's for our character. We want more people to live here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santiago. Uh, Mr. Gunter, before you, is Mr. King Kenny here? Oh, sorry. Mr. Kenny, welcome. And you have two minutes, sir. In light of the hour, I'll keep this brief. My name is King Kenny. I reside at 814 Yancey Street in a duplex, which uh, permits me to live in the city that I love. I enthusiastically support the HC, and I want to thank you for your work and all the research you've done. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Mr. Gunter, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. I was just so excited. Um, I'm Samuel Gunter. I live at 5115 Shady Bluff Street. I'm also the executive director of the North Carolina Housing Coalition. Uh, we're an organization whose mission is to lead a movement to ensure that every North Carolinian has a place to live with dignity and opportunity. And our membership consists of basically anyone who does affordable housing work, homeless service providers, housing counseling agencies, Habitat affiliates, for-profit and non-profit, low-income housing tax credit developers, and all of the advocates who care about affordable housing. And a lot of the work that I do uh, is spent trying to get resources to help folks at the lowest end of the income spectrum. Because in our country, no matter what county you're in, in every county in the United States, 
If you are an extremely low or low income family, it is impossible almost to find housing that you can afford. I cycled into this work, I was a pastor at one time and realized after doing that for a while, I could spend 75% of my time on walk-ins, folks needing to make a rent payment, make an electric bill payment and so on. Cycled into work at a Habitat affiliate and all these stories of folks that are working towards home ownership are incredible, but the stories that I also got to see were the long pipeline of folks that didn't even qualify because they were spending as high as one family, 78% of their income just on their housing payment, right? So I work a lot of times finding subsidies for the folks at the lowest end of the spectrum. But let's say you get something like a housing choice voucher, a Section 8 voucher in your hand. A lot of folks get that golden ticket and can't find housing. Because why, in a hot market like this, and in hot urban markets across the country, when you could find 18 other, why would you want to rent to someone where you got to jump through a hoop or two? That it's a big challenge, and the game is in land use. We play around at the subsidies trying to make that work, but if we are not expanding housing choices, we're missing the boat. And I, I echo the comments about the, our racist history of single family zoning and that the, the environments we see did not happen by accident and we are not gonna get out of it by accident. Uh, I support passage, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gunther. All right, um, I'll now uh, ask for Mr. Dan Jewell, Mr. Joseph English, Precious Allen and Germany McNeil, um, if you all could please come to my right. And as they come up, let me let me ask you all, let me just, so this is a public hearing, and I want to make sure that everyone gets heard. Is there anyone, because those are the last speakers who are signed up, is there anyone here who has not been heard who would like to be heard tonight? Okay, could you please come and... and uh, Sign one of the cards, please, at the clerk's desk. Is there anyone else who has not been heard that would like to be heard tonight? I want to make sure everyone that wants to be heard is heard. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jewell, uh, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Dan Jewell. I reside at 1025 Gloria Avenue in Trinity Park. I'm here representing myself. Uh, I want to come right out and say that I believe the proposal before you this evening is a necessary and important step in a first step in what needs to be a long community conversation to figure out how we handle the growth that is happening, whether we like it or not, and how to try and reduce the pressure on all the neighborhoods in Durham uh, of the continued cost escalation that's being created by there being more demand than supply. I followed the planning department's proposal going back to their workshops in December. It did not seem unreasonable to me, but I attended neighborhood meetings, listened to individuals, heard some concerns, particularly those over parking and densification of our urban tier neighborhoods. So I looked at my own block in Trinity Park, Gloria Avenue, Gregson, Lamond, Watt Street, with a nice alley running down the middle. And here's what I found. This block already represented a pretty high level of diversity and density. 32 single family houses, 25 apartment units, a half dozen ADUs already there, a commercial buildings and duplex units. What I found was that the, that block is less dense than when I moved there 18 years ago because of conversions of duplexes and, and rooming houses into single family houses. And I'm not talking about any of the student stuffers. I know most of my neighbors, they're great people. I love the fact that they are my neighbors, no matter what type of housing they live in. And I have never not been able to park either in front of my house or within one door of my house in all of that time. So the proposal before you today, I think is a great compromise from where we were, where we went, and where we are now. And I strongly support uh, you uh, passing it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Joseph English. Mr. English, welcome. You have two minutes. Hello, Mayor Shul. Thank you for the City Council and uh, Mayor Shul for listening to our comments tonight. I followed this planning process, I would say, not directly by going to all the meetings, but I have read about it over time. In my opinion, it goes 
a long way. But what it doesn't do is it does not address the question of affordable housing with teeth. It does not. Now, what, what we do do if the, with the bond is something that no one else in the nation has ever done. This is a bold uh, proposal by Mayor Shul, the $100 million bond. That is something I am all for, and I am all for um, us passing that, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to work to help that be passed. But this, this compromise proposal, as I've learning, I'm learning more and more about it tonight, um, could lead in another direction. Um, and why don't we just hit the pause button for another six months or another nine months and see how other things move forward? And I think a big part of this is going to be that bond and to see how much the public truly cares about the public getting behind something like that. Because no other city has done anything like this, not even close to it, and had success on it. And if we do, then bring this process back in. Because again, I hear all about compromise. I hear about a lot of, well, we might do this if we can, possibly in the future. But, we're, but that's not part of the process. We're hoping it is. We're hoping that this uh, generates other things in the future. But there, that's, not, that, that's a possibility. Um, and until those things are part of the future and part of the actual teeth in the, in the, in the new code, then I would say vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. English. Uh, Ms. Allen, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Precious Allen, 1027 Slate Worth. I am in support of EHC. I understand that it is a part of a multi-pronged approach to address housing solutions in our city. I am also for accountability for that process. And I want to encourage neighbors in the community to take the time to begin to educate yourselves um, about your current home ownership, your equity, what it allows you to do. I keep hearing the word affordable, and affordable is relative. I would love to hear more about the word accessibility in education, because when you talk about affordable and the most underserved in the community, what they lack is education making sure that the language that we have moving forward is plain language that people can easily understand and don't have to incur additional costs to translate that language. And so if you are truly concerned about your neighbors in the community, take the time to educate yourselves, access your local professionals, small developers, realtors, go and talk to your banks. I wanna remind you that change happens one conversation at a time. So when you walk into your bank, ask them, how can you use your equity to create an ADU or a granny flat or a tiny house? What does that mean? Do you even know what that process entails? Right now, you're fighting for something and you don't even understand the process. As we continue to grow in age, you're gonna have children that return to this city and may not be able to access housing. Not affordable, but simply access. Everybody doesn't come here from New York or California or somewhere where they make a gross amount of money and they're able to retain that. In the news, you're we're talking about a shift coming in the economy. What's gonna happen? I work on the front lines of real estate. I deal with people who had modifications in the last five years and are currently underemployed and may not be able to maintain their current single family residence. So I encourage you to educate yourself and plan. It's about leaving a legacy and what you learn, share with your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Ms. McNeil, welcome, and you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Germany McNeil. I live at 104 Acura Court. I am the owner of Durham Real Estate and Management Services and also a member of the collective. I manage about 60 properties around Durham, ranging from 800 to 2,500 per month, and I am for the EHC. There's an urgent need for more housing in Durham. The lack of supply is causing a higher demand and driving up pricing throughout Durham. Increasing the supply will hopefully help to lower the demand and regulate pricing. Hopefully this will also open the door for smaller builders to build a product that is more affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNeil. <laughs> and I would call that admiral, admiral, admirable brevity. Thank you. Um, we have three more people signed up, Mr. Brian Fox, Mr. Matt McDowell, and uh, Jay Royster Hills. And is there anyone else that would like to speak tonight? Uh, if you all could please come up. 
Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Anyone else like to be heard on this issue tonight who has not been heard? If there is anyone else, if you would please go to my left and sign up with the clerk. Um, we'll be closing the public hearing soon. Thank you. Mr. Fox. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Mr. Manager, staff, and neighbors. Thank you for the extra minute. Um, I just wanted to add the names of the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce, the Home Builders Association of Durham, Orange, and Chatham Counties, the Triangle Apartment Association, and the Triangle Community Coalition publicly in support of expanding housing choices. We recognize and congratulate the city on taking a proactive and bold stance on housing affordability and being one of the first communities in the Triangle to make changes to its zoning regulations to allow more housing. The necessary changes as depicted in the Expanding Housing Choices Initiative will create a multitude of housing options for such a dynamic city, of which I think I forgot to call myself a resident, Brian Fox, 909 Exum Street. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mr. McDowell. Um, hi, good evening. Uh, Matt McDowell. I'm at 1540 Hermitage Court. Um, first of all, it's wonderful to live in a community where it's nearly 11 o'clock and there are over, a, you know, 100 people here still in the room discussing a zoning policy. Um, <laughs> it's a unique place, full, full city. Um, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would encourage you all to vote against this proposal tonight. Um, and there are just a couple of points. I don't want to rehash what's been said, but um, maybe just a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, so much of the success of EHC would hinge on this idea that a less regulated free market will yield more affordable housing. And unfortunately, I think when we look at um, what other cities, you know, the experience of other cities, even the experience here, um, there's just not a lot of evidence to support the idea uh, that an upzoning will yield some of the outcomes, I think, on which there's great agreement um, in the room. And the, the second element of EHC that troubles me is the fact that it is tailored so much toward one part of Durham, toward the urban tier. Um, and it's the part of Durham that's already quite, uh, quite built up, um, unsurprisingly. Um, and I wonder, a lot of us wonder why this discussion isn't part of a broader discussion about our schools, about our transportation, about our environment. And conveniently, we're already in the early stages of a comprehensive plan rewrite. Um, I believe the last one, based on an earlier comment, was done in 2005. So we have a great opportunity. Um, you've already heard some trepidation, even from, from folks who are generally supportive of EHC, you know, talking about, well, maybe it would be prudent to delay this for a year or something. We have an opportunity through the comprehensive plan rewrite to talk about how zoning fits with that plan and with so many other things that are important to Durham. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. Ms. Royster Hills. I'm sorry. You have two minutes. Yeah. Hi. My name is Jean Royster Hills. I'm a transplant from New York. I came to Durham because it just got too expensive and I didn't want to grow old in New York. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, let me say that I understood what the gentleman was saying. It was a bit disingenuous of you, Mr. Mayor, to say that it was complicated because most of us did understand what he was saying. It was the way it was presented. Second of all, I want to say that I am the face of those people who are renting rooms in big apartments and in, in houses because I pay over 50% of my Social Security for housing because I cannot afford to find, I cannot find decent housing. The word is decent housing. That is affordable in Durham. I've been here 15, 15 years. No, I've been here nine years. And the places that I have been able to afford, I've picked up and moved out of because there's a certain element that I just do not and refuse to want to live with. So what I would, I see that the die is already cast for this thing that they're talking about because I see that when you get a, a, um, a lot and you divide it in half, so you're selling both lots at double the money. So you're making your money and I already see that die is cast. I just want to say that I'm the face of the individual who cannot afford, have a, a decent affordable housing. And I say that to say that it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Royster Hills. Uh, we now have three more speakers who have signed up. Ms. Constance Wright. 
Mr. Brian Burwell and Ashley Strom. Is there anyone else who would like to sign up to speak? Is there anyone else that would like to speak? If you would like to speak, uh, please come to the podium to my left and sign a card. This is a public hearing. I'll make sure every voice that would like to be heard is heard. Ms. Wright, welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Yes, my name is Constance Wright, and I live at 2605 DeMille Street, and I am a lifelong resident of Durham. I've been here for 66 years, and I have seen all kinds of changes. To me, and I'm not versed on all the EHCs and all of that, but to me, um, Durham is pushing the people who have been here the longest and have done the most for this city, you're pushing us out, okay? Every part of Durham that I've lived in is either gentrified <laughs> or you're trying to tear, you know, take away part of it. You've taken away the Feather Street projects. You know, you're just taking everything away. And like I said, gentrification is real. My friend lives on the street that the house is, um, are like three, four hundred thousand dollars, and these, this, they have lived there all of their life, you know. But now they're getting ready to be pushed out. My taxes are going up. My neighborhood is changing, and everything is just not affordable. And then the people who have been pushed out of the city, they are out in the outskirts. There's no transportation out there. You have to walk for miles to catch a bus to get to anywhere. And I just wish that the city would at least look at everybody. You know, you've taken care of people who've never lived here. You're making room for people to come in here and move us out of our own place. So that's what I got to say. Thank you, Ms. Wright. <laughs> Mr. Brian Burwell, followed by Ms. Ashley Strom, and that will be our final speaker. Hello, I'm Brian Burwell. I live at 106 Sparger Springs Lane. I can't support the initiative as it's been proposed. We need something that will promote diversity of equity, not just diversity of neighborhoods. Splitting properties into smaller units and leaving the equity with this original owner only will delay the gentrification by lowering the rent initially, but it will continue to rise. And as it does rise, it will push people further out into the units that are farther from where they want to be. So I would have to say that part of the proposal should include at least the relinquishing of part of the divisions of the properties so that you can have new ownership and allow more people to have built equity into the place they want to live. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burwell. We'll now hear from Ashley Strom. Ms. Strom, congratulations. You're the final speaker. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited. My heart, I'm so excited about this. I've been to City Hall multiple times about this. I've met in your innovation lab. We talked about housing displaced populations <coughs> that are recently incarcerated. I've been speaking to Scott Harmon at Studio Center Architecture. I've been meeting with community members. I am currently a resident of 1222 North Miami Boulevard. I live on a double lot and I am $80,000 in student loan debt. And uh, my husband and I have been together for four years and we have housed five people in our home sharing bathrooms and other associated things because I believe that people all deserve a great place to live. And not everybody's like us. Not everybody wants to share a bathroom with a stranger. Not everybody wants to rent, AKA have you stay for free with your reptiles and your boa constrictors and all that other stuff. I got a lot of stories about people living in our home. <laughs> and wouldn't it be nice if I had the money to build an ADU in my backyard? I've met with contractors I've met with you know, tons of people. I don't have the money, and it needs to come from a systemic place. Um, we've had these conversations, and I'm one of the people who's really excited about this coming from above me. Um, and for the people who are 28 years old and are probably gonna be paying on their student loans for the rest of my life and are delaying having children because my baby is my mortgage of a student loan every month, 
I believe in a future for my generation and for people who are like me and who are just trying to get a college education and make a way, um, but I don't foresee this being sustainable. Um, so I appreciate you guys taking the steps to making sure that people who are young, people who are old, and people who are everywhere in between have a safe, awesome place to live in Durham. So thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Ms. Strom. All right. Okay, I want to thank everyone who's come out to speak tonight, and I'm going to uh, declare this public hearing closed, and then we will have now uh, any questions, discussion, and so forth from members of the council. Um, anyone like to start? Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, uh, and could um, Pat, could you come to the microphone? Because I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> Sorry. I know it's a late night already. Um, I just want to have some clarification on some of the things that I've heard, which was this uh, being able to get six units on a lot, and that seemed not. I think there was a version where we were looking at lot sizes more aggressively, but in this current version, there's only just a small lot size. It's 25. Right, so the, the specific yield from any lot would depend on the size of the lot and the zoning district that it's in. Um, but if, if you select the small house option, um, you could potentially get on an existing lot of a minimum of 50 feet width, um, get um, six units. The maximum size of the um, primary unit on each lot would be 1,200 square feet. Right. So if it was a duplex, it would be 600 square feet or 800 and 400. So you could yield potentially, um, depending on zoning district and the size of the lot, six units from where there's currently one. But they the the units that were yielded would have to be small units and essentially, for lack of a better term, affordable by design, meaning a maximum of 1,200 square feet. Right. So I'm just trying to, so it's a, you can get there, but it's not a likely outcome. I think Friends. I think it's unlikely excuse in a lot second. of areas excuse because second, existing high. Friends, excuse me a second. Yeah. Everybody has been listening really respectfully to all the speakers, and I'm going to ask the folks in the audience to please afford everyone the same respect. Thank you. Yeah, the, as I tried to allude to in my earlier comments, the the economics are changed from block to block and across time. So it's uh, any of, of outcomes that are legal are possible. But I, I believe that there are large portions of urban tier where land values are already very high, and therefore it's somewhat unlikely that there's going to be that kind of conversion. It's possible, certainly possible, and it, it almost certainly will happen somewhere. Thank you. Um, so going along, so that, that was a question. What did you, what was your opinion, and it, it changes from, uh, the Planning Commission's, I guess, June um, proposal, and then hearing from some of our affordable housing folks around these technical assistance and financial assistance, and then um, initially potentially holding off up to 12 months. Just curious about what, why staff moved away from some of those ideas. Uh, sure. So I, I think I'm hearing three three things there. Let me take the middle one first. I think was. Um, about the delay. Yeah. So something we've talked about a lot with the community as we've been out is that to the extent to which, and several speakers alluded to this, the extent to which um, public and nonprofit um, funds um, are focused on using these provisions to produce affordable housing, it will be more effective at producing affordable housing. So, but there, to, to my knowledge, is not any current um, plan or program to ensure um, that alignment. We will certainly work with our partners and community development and OEWD and other departments to see if that can be created. I think we'll do that independently of whether there's a deferred um, date of implementation. So that's something that we certainly support, but we understand that there are competing um, needs for the bond proceeds, for example, and for our federal allocations. So we'll have to work through that with the administration, with our partner departments. As I said, tried to say earlier, we're going to do that regardless of whether there's a deferred date or, or not. Okay. That same, same applies to technical outreach programs and um, community engagement. That's certainly warranted. Um, there is some chance that, although um, the per unit cost should go 
down because you can get more units, land values may go somewhat up. And so there could be uh, increase in speculation and unscrupulous folks trying to buy property. So the, the extent to which we um, provide high quality information to the public is beneficial. I don't think that needs a 12 month deferral period, but, but that's certainly you all's judgment. Uh, thank you. In general, I just wanted to say that the material you all provided us was excellent. I uh, definitely appreciated some of the shifts that I saw, especially around the height requirements. Um, I appreciated the nuance that you all applied there. And in fact, in some cases, it's more restrictive under EHC than it is currently. And I think that that is actually aiding some of these very tall three-story houses that we are seeing that are actually already teardowns that we're seeing everywhere and they're massive single-family homes. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. I also appreciated uh, the work that you all did. Um, just clarifying some of the building width in the infill was really helpful, just seeing that it's back to context and understanding that better. I appreciated a lot, a lot of that. I appreciated the, um, some of the simplification, especially like around the side yards where it's just more continuous depending on the housing type and it didn't look like there before there was a lot more variation. So I think it will be a benefit to uh, builders and developers because now it's just a more standardized process. So I just wanted to provide that feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Councilmember Caballero. Uh, Councilmember Austin. Um, thank you. Someone mentioned the um, a policy about the number of unrelated people allowed in into into one dwelling unit. Um, that's a, is that a part of this proposal? And so, uh, Councilmember Alston, it's not. Right. Um, one of the principles we tried to adhere to from the beginning was to not propose changes that are beyond the policy scope of the 2005 comprehensive plan. Um, but, and that, um, that limitation on this uh, household uh, unrelated individuals has been in place since late 80s, early 90s, and carried through um, into to, uh, 2005 comp plan. That being said, I think expanding that number of unrelated individuals would be a very significant uh, way to improve housing access and affordability and something we would support, but we want to pursue that under a, a different initiative <clears throat> con concurrent with the comprehensive plan. Right. Okay. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Anybody else? Council Member Freeman? So just, uh, I have a lot of questions, and I'm recognizing it's late in the evening, and it would be nice to have this laid out in a format that was more like a, a chart. Um, but my, the one question I keep playing back, and, and it's based on some of the comments that I'm hearing, I think that there's a lot of folks who are supporting and contingent on a lot of other things, and I don't know that they're actually included in this conversation at all. And so it's, it's worrying me that I think folks are misguided in their support if they think that it's going to change unrelated, change, or be, a, be actually included with the bond, because there's been no conversation about that. If there has, I've missed it. Um, and all, there were a few other things that have come up that I'm kind of like, I, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> Is there a specific reason why this has to happen now as opposed to next year when the comprehensive plan is being implemented? Is there something that pushes us to move within the next hour versus 12 months? I think that just that the housing, um, our housing accessibility and production problem is significant and is contributing to the lack of affordability. Uh, and that everything we're proposing is consistent with policy guidance we've had in place for over a decade. I think those are, those are the only two reasons. And I think I come back to the question, just based on what, where I was going earlier with the question around, if you missed the goal the last time with the plan, mm -hmm. what's the likelihood of that being this, this time with the plan? And how do we factor in all of that so that we're not chasing our tail on the affordability because that is essentially what we're selling this as, as a way to build affordability and I'm still not seeing the connection. Because I recognize that increasing the number of units and what we're talking about at this point is about 300 over the course of five years with the help of development. So that's not even like any major 
I'm, I'm missing something. Because, I mean, folks are telling us that there's going to be like this exuberant amount of units, and we're talking about 300. So, so the 300 was the uh, 2005 projection for the number of units we would need annually in the urban tier to meet our growth goals of the 2005 comprehensive plan. So we've been producing about 95 new units a year. We think if we can get that to 140 in the first year, which is an increase of 45 over the average, and then that number, the 140, would increase by 10% every year after that. Um, eventually, we would get to 300. I think, the, as I tried to allude to earlier, after the policy document of the 2005 comprehensive plan was adopted, we, the planning department, did not take action to take implementing zoning regulations that realized the vision. That's what we're doing now, uh, 14 years later. And a year before the comprehensive plan would be looked at. Well, the, 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 level, I like think not. the conditions that we've tried to describe um, warrant it. That's certainly a year judgment. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, have a few questions. Uh, yeah, sure, Councilmember Middleton, please. Yield if you want to. No, no, go ahead. Go Thank ahead. you, sir. I know the uh, hour is upon us. Um, the EHC on its face resonates with me. It resonates deeply. Um, so did the Declaration of Independence and the GI Bill. But we know that the devil is in the details. Um, I, am, I am inclined to, to support it, but I, I want to I put some caveats out there. Firstly, single family um, zoning is indeed a vestige of racism, mm -hmm. but simply removing that vestige of racism without cutting the check for all of the equity all of the generational wealth that was generated over decades for people is not going to address the problem. I mean, it's well-intentioned, but the, 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 the effect of those single-family homes was wealth being passed down to Johnny and Jane over and over again. And simply removing that without cutting the check is not really addressing uh, the issue. Um, I, um, I'm concerned because the, the AHC may indeed in, uh, address growth. But who are we growing by? The folks that are coming to our city are coming $10,000 wealthier than the average person here. Um, they've got more disposable income. They're largely white, no problem with white folk. Um, so, so my concern is that if we, if we sell this, at, now, if we put a bunch of folk in one place, that will affect, that will indeed address growth. But I'm, I have some questions and concerns about the affordability issue. Um, I grew up around a lot of affordable, dense housing. It was called the projects. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of folk lived there. But the difference was is that it, the, the amount, the affordability wasn't based upon the amount of space you had. It was location, location, location. So the same amount of space in Red Hook, the old Red Hook where I grew up, um, may be one price. But you take that same amount of space in Brooklyn Heights, and, and it's astronomically more because you can look out the window and see the Brooklyn Bridge. Or see, at that time, the Twin Towers. So if the urban tier is, is our Brooklyn Heights, if it's that desirable, I, I, I'm, I'm a little suspicious of leaning on uh, the private market to yield affordability. Consider the forays that our city has had into affordable housing. Um, 80 units uh, at Jackson Street. I actually was part of the team that led the effort for Durham County to get it there. Look at how much money we spent. It was our land. We needed a, 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 a low-income housing tax credit to yield 80 units. Now, we might do it again with the new police headquarters. We may have, we'll have 80 units, probably have 80 units of housing there. That's 160 total. That, that's the dent, and that's what the government, the full weight of the government, using all of our levers, all of our power, our land, our foray into the market will yield, at best, 160 units. So. And, and, and the affordable housing density, bo density bonus, what kind of track record, how successful have we been using that? So, so my question is, is that the only inducement uh, that, that we have to private developers to develop affordable? I, I know they'll get more housing on the lot, but if you have a bunch of folk paying really, really high rents, not because they've got space, but because the neighborhood is desirable. Location, location, location is what all my real estate friends always tell me. So it, it's quite possible that we'll have density of, of wealthy projects. No offense. Uh, um, oh, right. living, 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 
Yeah, kind of like what we're seeing already. So, so much like the Declaration of Independence needed to be worked on in the GI Bill, needed some work in tw uh, uh, tweaking, um, if we pass this, I don't know if I, if I trust having a report every year. I may want it every six months. Because, and we saw what the unintended consequences were with Southside when the, when the government had a foray into that. Well intended, but we saw what happened. So, so I, I don't want to, to put gentrification on steroids um, and, and put gas in the engine. Because if, if the density bonus, which has not had a stellar track record, let's just be honest about it, if that's what we're counting on, uh, to induce private developers to make units affordable in the most desirable neighborhood in our city right now. Uh, when, we, when we've done it, we, we only got 160 units out of it with a, for a whole lot of money. So if that's the only inducement, I, I want to be very careful that we don't oversell it uh, to folk, particularly poor black people, once again, getting our hopes up, getting us all in our feelings. And then we do, a, we do address growth but what we've done is put a whole bunch of rich people on top of one another. Um, so, 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 but, but, uh, you know, America is a promise and ongoing conversation. So we have to keep working towards the declaration. We have to keep working to, to make sure even well-intended things are, are executed well. So it, I, I wanted to say to my colleagues and, and, and to uh, us up here, um, my vote is going to be a yes vote, but we, we, we need to be very, very, very diligent and mindful and, and I will apologize if a year from now, two years from now, this, this does exactly what I've outlined the possibility of it. I, I, I don't, you know, I, have a, I, I don't trust the market to itself produce affordable housing. And, and if our only sword, our only quiver, our only arrow in the quiver is a is density bonus, we don't have a great track record, track record with that. So I would recommend that we look at this every six months uh, rather than 12 months and that we be prepared as a body if we see because we've seen this movie before. I come from a community that's been hurt before. Uh, if, if we see uh, uh, those trends that we've seen in so many other places um, take place, that we should be prepared to take corrective action. But I will support EHC. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I have some comments. Uh, I am, um, first of all, I want to speak a little of the process. The, uh, I really appreciate all the public input we've had on this for a long period of time. We've had a lot of people participate. And um, I am just very grateful to all of you all on all sides of this who've been here uh, and who have uh, written us and have met with us and with each other. Uh, it's, it's a great, uh, the, uh, the uh, gentleman who said, uh, it's great to live in a city where people are here at 11 o'clock, now 11.17 at night, uh, talking about zoning uh, is absolutely right. Uh, this is a great exercise in democracy, and whatever side of this you are on, I'm grateful. Um, we often are faced with very easy decisions, and then sometimes we're faced with difficult ones, issues that have a lot of uh, tangles to them and sides to them, and this is one of those. And so it takes a lot of a lot of work on our part as as well as on yours. Um, what I try to do in situations like this, uh, in, in my, the, my way of dealing with this, is I try to listen through the whole process. Uh, last night, I sat down and wrote out some remarks. And then what I try to do during the public hearing is really listen to see if there's anything that substantially, uh, and I've been listening for months. And now, is there anything at the end that really substantially challenges what I thought? And I heard a lot of great comments tonight, but nothing that substantially challenged what I thought when I sat down last night to write. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. First of all, I want to just say to our staff, um, there's been some criticism in the process. And I just uh, want to say very clearly uh, to Pat and your staff that the level of outreach, the professionalism that you all have showed, I think has been exemplary. Uh, it's been a... Our agenda package uh, for this meeting was absolutely terrific. It's really one of the best we've ever had uh, in my eight, eight years here. Uh, and the public has been the beneficiary of this level of information, including the survey, the research review, which I thought was great to add to the agenda packet, uh, the panel, that, the public panel from, the, from Minneapolis, 
high level of outreach that you've done. And I've, I've heard criticism of the outreach, but I don't agree with it. I think that the outreach has been substantial. I think you've engaged as, as well as, uh, we, we've, it's, I think it's been a very, very high level of engagement. And I'm not trying to get you to stay in there, Pat. I don't have any questions or anything. So if you want to, you're good. But um, I am also satisfied with the staff's commitment to, and I have very much confidence in their ability to successfully monitor the results of the EHC on an ongoing basis and report back to us annually or semi-annually, Councilmember Middleton. Uh, and I agree that that monitoring is extremely important. Um, the staff has said, and many of you all have said, that we don't really know uh, all the exact consequences and, uh, that are uh, of, of, of any policy like this that we pass. Uh, and so we are going to need careful monitoring. Um, and I think that that's going to be very important, and I have very strong confidence in the ability of our staff to do that and in the desire of this council to make that happen. So I'm going to be voting uh, in favor of the EHC tonight, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that. One issue that we've talked about a lot, uh, Ms. Plass, and I've really appreciated your efforts. You've been a fabulous advocate for your position. Um, and others have talked about the issue of the growth of our population. Um, I, I, I'll just say simply that, in, according to the census, in 2014, our population was 251,000. And according to the census, in 2018, four years later, it was 274,000. And this is a growth of a little more than 8,000 people per year for the past four years. Um, certainly, some of that is, is, uh, is, is births, but a lot of it is people moving in. The growth of our city and the lagging growth of our housing stock is indisputable. And if you're poor and you live in Durham, you're living that reality every day. We heard from a couple people, uh, Ms. Wright, uh, Ms. Royster Hills, and others who talked about that reality. There is no question that our city is growing fast and that our housing stock is not keeping up with it and it is driving people farther and farther out of town in places that and because where they have been living is less and less affordable. I'm glad to see in this proposal the additional housing types that will be allowed in cluster and conservation subdivisions, something we didn't talk about tonight, but something that members of the council have been asking the department to review for some time, and I'm grateful to see that you all have included that. I appreciate the tree requirements that are coming with the expanding housing choices. I agree with the planning commission and staff and others who have spoken here tonight, that the three-person rule is something that we need to discuss, and I'll be looking forward to that discussion in the coming months. I, I appreciate Planning Commissioner uh, George Bryan's concern about the Airbnb growth in Durham and his fear that ADUs and other kinds of housing could be used predominantly for Airbnb. I think we need to keep a close eye on our Airbnb situation so we don't get in the situation that we know that our friends in Asheville are in, where Airbnbs were badly hurting housing affordability. Uh, we aren't there yet, as far as I know, but this is something we need to keep an eye on, and I appreciate his expression of that concern. I am, uh, and now I want to talk why I am planning to vote for the staff's recommendation and why I'm and uh, enthusiastically in support of this. I have very much appreciated all the public input we have received. Uh, we have heard especially from folks in a couple of neighborhoods in opposition to EHC with very important concerns, and I understand these concerns, especially the concern about additional teardowns that would be caused by expand, that could be caused by expanding housing choices. What I see in response to that, and I want to say this very clearly, because I think that that's a very, very, very important and valid concern, is that we already have accelerating teardowns in Durham, and that the houses that are being torn down are being replaced by large single-family homes that are not contributing to the increased supply that we desperately need in the urban tier. I don't believe that EHC will significantly accelerate that trend, and I do believe that EHC has important benefits that, that outweigh those concerns. I do agree that that needs to be monitored and we need to monitor that carefully. But we are already seeing accelerating teardowns for large single family houses. We all know that. The staff says that EHC is, quote, anticipated to aid 
in providing more affordable and attainable housing options, end quote. And I believe that that will occur over the long term. One of the things that the literature on this makes clear is that the filtering process that occurs with this kind of policy takes a long time. We can evaluate this in six months, we can evaluate it in a year, but we're not gonna know the real results of it for some time. This is not an instant or quick process. I agree with staff that single family zoning in some in-demand neighborhoods does, as, as they say, quote, set dominoes in motion, causing displacement in other neighborhoods where housing is less expensive and newcomers can afford to outbid existing residents. Single family zoning in some in-demand neighborhoods sets dominoes in motion, causing displacement in other neighborhoods. As long as we have exclusive single family neighborhoods in the urban tier, like my own, we are going to have this cause and effect, and that is not fair and it's not good for our city. On page six of the staff memo, the staff lays out what they call an aspirational goal of expanding housing choices. An aspirational goal of expanding housing choices is to make it possible, legal under the zoning ordinance, to build attainable market rate housing for middle income households, which in turn may reduce economic displacement of low income households. Along with the increasing cost of labor and construction materials, zoning rules that require large lots land is increasingly expensive, and limit housing types makes it very challenging to build a housing unit that is market rate affordable or attainable for middle income home buyers. While developers will still build luxury housing if the market demands it, EHC aims to make it economically possible to build for middle income households by allowing smaller lots, more housing types, and more flexibility with accessory units. An additional goal behind the proposals for accessory dwelling units, and the option to subdivide to a small flag lot is to help existing homeowners who may have excess land that they are willing to either build on or to subdivide to generate additional needed income. Building an ADU can provide rental income to help with mortgage payments or tax bills, but can also be a complex and expensive process. Simplifying the approval process and providing access to financing mechanisms for middle and low income households is a next logical step. Subdividing the backyard into separate flag lot for a small house is an alternative to building an ADU and could ex offer the existing homeowner an opportunity to do access equity that they have tied up in the land, allowing them to stay in place. That's what the staff wrote. And I think these are very important and very worthy goals that the staff has set out. Plus they are limited goals, which take out, take into account, I believe, the reality of what expanding housing choices can aspire to do. I appreciate these goals and the moderate, the moderate tone with which they are set forth. These are not set forth as goals that are uh, uh, um, that, that are set forth as goals that are going to make instant change tomorrow that's huge. They are set out as goals that will be incrementally achieved and they are set out as goals that are modest and understand the lim their limitations. And to those goals are to create more, the ability to have more housing for middle income families in what are now single family neighborhoods so that people who are moving here will have other choices and won't be driving up the prices in low income neighborhoods. And that is what is happening now in our city. And that's what's causing enormous displacement and the unaffordability, the increasing unaffordability of our city. I live in a historic district and I want to comment on the Planning Commission's recommendation, which the staff did not adopt, to exempt historic districts from the EHC. As the staff said in its response to this recommendation, there will be no change with the adoption of EHC in the protections for historic districts through the certificate of appropriateness process or the ability to delay demolition. As I know only too well from some recent experience with trying to save some historic properties from the bulldozer, calls that I have been making on behalf of Preservation Durham, the demolition, de de the demolition delay is an imperfect solution that doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. That won't change for the good or the bad with the adoption of EHC. I strongly agree 
of the staff's decision not to exempt historic districts like the one I live in from these rules. I especially want to allow myself with the passionate and powerful com comments of Planning Commissioner Santiago, who spoke to us earlier today, concerning the recommendation for this exemption. We have some planning commissioners in our city, Mr. Tom Miller, Mr. Al Turk, Mr. Nate Baker, and others who often write stirringly and with incredible knowledge about important issues. Uh, and I really value the commentary of our planning commissioners, but I have rarely read testimony like this from a planning commissioner, Mr. Santiago. You wrote at the end of a long essay, and I quote, due to countless years of social injustices for communities of color related to housing, employment opportunities, and education, to name a few, I would like to highlight how these studies' observations over decades helps identify how we must be cognizant of the systemic issues that create and perpetuate the predicaments we find ourselves in today. By excluding local historically designated neighborhoods in the urban tier, I worry that we are voting to perpetuate systemic injustices. As mentioned earlier, the areas at greatest risk of continuing to gentrify more rapidly, and most importantly, displacing long-term resi long residents, are largely communities that do not have this designation. This designation, the historic designation, should not be exempted from EHC rules. He is exactly right. Exempting historic districts from the EHC would perpetuate systemic injustice, just as he has said. I want to address the Planning Commission's request for a 12-month delay in the implementation of EHC, except for affordable housing developers. The Commission gives three reasons for this proposed delay, and this has been supported by the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit as well. First, they want to allow time for the city staff to develop a plan for low-income homeowners to be able to finance ADUs. This is a very important and worthy goal. And I'm very appreciative of the Planning Commission putting this concern forward, as did the Coalition. I want to point out that the financing for these ADUs is in the affordable housing bond that we'll be voting for in November. If you care about low-income homeowners' ability to finance ADUs, it is critical that you get out and vote for the bond on November 5th. At the same time, I believe that the good that the EHC will do over time to promote affordable housing means that we need to get started with it right now. It is important to have the tool to fund ADUs, but that should not delay our decision to go forward with this important policy, which on its own, over time, will increase housing affordability. The Planning Commission also recommended delay for 12 months so that the Planning Department could have time to set up a system of data collection and monitoring. I do not believe this delay is necessary to set up this system. That work has already begun, as we know, as the resolution we are being asked tonight indicates. And finally, the Planning Commissioners delay for more ongoing public input. Since they met, we have had more and more public input. And I'm very satisfied that we've had a full, robust community conversation about expanding housing choices. I see no reason to delay this implementation. I have read not all, perhaps, but most of the articles that the planning staff has listed in the literature review and other articles that, th that those of you all have sent to me as well. I have read Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, which includes a devastating critique of the way zoning laws, including single-family-only neighborhoods, have deliberately discriminated against African Americans who were effectively locked out of these neighborhoods by this zoning, which created conditions which were impossible for these African American residents to meet. Durham's own Uneven Ground Project details this racist history in Durham, and Andrew Whittemore's research on every zoning decision in Durham over many, many years, every single zoning decision, creates a devastating picture of how the creation of single-family neighborhoods through zoning operated against African Americans here in the city we love. Although there are some disputes within the literature, a consensus does emerge from this literature. That consensus is that the history of racism has driven the creation of these single-family neighborhoods, while other neighborhoods allowed much more varied housing, as Whittemore has pointed out. The consensus is also clear that more market-rate housing, such as EHC would facilitate, does not have near the effect on housing affordability that the production and preservation of subsidized affordable housing does, which is why we have to pass the affordable housing bond if we want to make the biggest difference we can in housing affordability in Durham. But the consensus is also clear that the production of more market rate housing does hold down increases in rent across the city through the filtering process over time. And it does take time. It isn't a quick fix. Finally, as the staff says, 
EHC isn't a silver bullet for housing affordability, but it does help. As Baca and Lebovitz say in the title of their article, zoning reform isn't magical, but it's crucial. I am proud to support this important step towards a fairer Durham and towards housing affordability. I'm appreciative of everyone who's come out to speak tonight and everyone who wrote to us on both sides of this issue. And I look forward to monitoring results of EHC going forward should it pass tonight. All right, are there comments or questions by other members of the council? Anyone else? Count, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to um, relay a couple of thoughts and then respond to some of the other concerns that we've heard tonight. So no public policy can do everything that we need, um, not in the housing space or in any other space. And accordingly, the EHC is not gonna do everything. It's not designed to do everything. We need many different tools and this is just one of those tools. And it's designed to do one very specific thing and I think it's designed well and that's to help make room for people to live in our urban core where they can be closer to jobs, closer to schools, closer to transit and live a more environmentally sustainable lifestyle. I want to be clear that I don't want people to feel like we are overselling what EHC can do. There are some things that we as a city government just cannot do at all. And in the context of a private consumer market for housing that we especially can't do. So we're taking action within a range of very specific constraints that are dictated by state laws, <coughs> by our economic system, by the system from, of housing that we have. And we're trying to figure out how to make the best and most effective moves within that space. And as the mayor said, everything that we're already everything that we're afraid of is already happening. I live in a neighborhood where we have already seen an incredible amount of displacement of people of color from my community. We have rising rents; it's already happening. We have teardowns. We have conversion of duplexes into single-family homes, um, and so we can't stop those market forces from happening. What we can do is act within the scope of what we are allowed to do as a local government to try to make the situation better. Um, we can't stop the growth that we're experiencing at whatever rate we decide that we're experiencing it, but we can provide better options. Again, in the hope of not overselling, I don't know if EHC will create more housing affordability. I hope that it will. I think there's strong evidence that it will, but it's absolutely true that we cannot say that for sure. But what I do think that we can say for sure is that it will create more housing access and that that's also critical for the situation that we are in right now. Um, we, the city has been rightly focused on affordable housing for a long time. We know that's a crisis and we continue to work really hard on that crisis, for example, with the affordable housing bond. But, and we're not only doing EHC, right? We're doing a lot more than that. Um, but we need more market rate housing too. We also have a shortage of market rate housing and that's also a critical piece of building a community where everybody can afford to live. Um, again, I'm not excited about a delay. I think if this is good public policy, we shouldn't wait. We should pass it now because we need it now. Um, and I believe it is good public policy. A couple of the um, concerns that people brought up that I just wanted to comment on around technical assistance. I agree completely that we need to make sure that we have technical assistance available for people who might want to build an ADU or might want to figure out how they can subdivide their lot and either build something or sell their backyard for development. There is technical assistance available already through our development service center in the planning department. I'm working on, I live in a neighborhood that's already, that was redlined and is already zoned for duplexes and I'm building a duplex and have gotten a lot of great assistance and the folks that I'm working with have already from the planning department, so that's available. I'd be really excited about building some more specific um, assistance for people who wanna take advantage of the new EHC provisions. I think we should do that. Financing for ADUs um, is included in the five-year housing plan that we're hoping to fund with the bond. And so, again, this is part of a larger package. It's not gonna do everything, but with all these different tools combined, I think we can really make a difference. Um, again, we talked a lot about the monitoring that's happening. I am really excited about expanding the number of people who can live in a single family dwelling, and I'm glad that we're gonna be looking into that with a comp plan. Definitely agree with folks about parking minimums not being, um, not being a great idea. I need to learn more about why we have them. I know that there are, um, in certain cases, it's hard to get financing if you don't have parking. 
um, but that's not necessarily a reason why we should have it in our zoning code. So I'm looking forward to having that discussion as well as part of the COP plan. And with regard to the environmental sustainability questions, we know definitively that infill is more sustainable than sprawl. And if we are gonna grow, we need to grow in as much as possible. Um, so <laughs> I don't think that an environmental impact study, for example, would show us anything different. Um, we need infill development. We need it in our urban core. And we know that walk walkable, bikeable neighborhoods are always gonna be healthier and more sustainable than ones where you have to own a car to go anywhere. Um, so I'll be supporting this proposal. I'm looking forward to the opportunities that we'll have to continue to monitor implementation and make sure that it's doing what we want to do. But I'm confident in the opinions of our of our planning staff and in the reading that I've done that this is a good policy for Durham and that we should move forward with it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. All right. If there are no more comments, I just have Councilmember Freeman. I I appreciate the mayor Mayor Pro Tem expanding on their framing around how to, how you would support um, this proposed expanded housing choices solution. And I agree on many of those, um, the way, in the way it's framed, I agree on many levels, but there are some caveats that I think we're not even discussing, which should be on the table and, it, and mainly around um, if we're, if we're gonna go about addressing affordable housing in a way that's so loose, we're gonna have to make sure that we're looking at how we're making a way to plant or setting forward a way to have the conversation around source of income and not being able to, um, to discriminate against people who receive Section 8 vouchers, essentially. And also, we are gonna have to have the conversation about how um, unrelated residents in a home, like we, what, the, what folks are actually thinking should be involved in this conversation needs to actually be involved and it doesn't need to be surfaced. And so I'm, con, I'm, st I'm still concerned and I will be voting no. Um, the context of, of setting up how the bond is set, like the bond is the passage and this is how we're gonna get all of this through, I, I get it. But what I, The only way for, for this to work is for you to go forward with it. And so I'm walking this walk and I'm going along with the ride. But I, I mean, I'm also in a neighborhood, in a historic district that was designated specifically for a middle class neighborhood where there were some, um, where there was some people of color who owned their homes and the ability to get those accessory dwelling units the ability to do all the things that we're talking about, even the flag lots in areas where there is a extra lot, like extra space. There, these are all concepts that have been in, implemented by developers in our city. And I don't see it. I just don't see it. I know you, I know you hold faith into it, but I can't see it. Okay. And I hope that we'll continue the conversation because it's not done. All right, thank you, council member. All right, if there are no more comments, uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Austin, I apologize. And then I think my colleague as well. I'm oh, sorry, it looks like there are more comments, my, my bad. All right, um, I'll be relatively brief. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, expanding housing choices is a significant change uh, to our zoning code. It's one that reflects a lot of work and expertise and, and courage on the part of our staff, uh, one that has forced all of us to confront systemic racism, class bias, and it's also a change that will begin to orient us towards a more sustainable future, as described, I think, very well by my colleague, the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, expanding housing choices does a lot, but it is also limited in its scope. It is tailored to address specific aspects of our code in specific residential areas. It's not intended as a substitute for our comprehensive plan revision or our affordable housing goals. And because of that, this proposal does not mark the end of our work together to address um, other issues with land use, transportation, environmental demands, and concerns that will still exist even if we pass expanding housing choices tonight. We are and will continue to aggressively prioritize affordable housing, including historic levels of investment if our residents do support the $95 million housing bond this November. 
um, adequate and sustainable development in our suburban tier to respond to our growth, and transit-oriented development here and across our region. Um, these are not just our goals, they're our responsibilities. And I just wanna say to you all that um, I, I intend to con continue to, uh, excuse me, to work aggressively on those issues, and I hope that we as a council and our staff and our community can work on those issues together. And I also look forward to voting in favor of the uh, expanding housing choices tonight. Thank you, Councilmember Ross. And Councilmember Caballero. Thank you. I also will be brief. I just wanted to say I will be supporting expanding housing choices this evening. I think that thank you for everyone who was here this evening. I hear the concern from community. Um, I also recognize that uh, this is incremental, as was stated by our planning director, Pat Young. We failed in 2005, and we're in 16 years of a failure. These are changes that should have happened earlier to meet our housing goals, and we've only added more residents. I also want to highlight many of the folks who came out and shared their personal stories of being small developers, small um, uh, homeowners that are willing to, are already thinking about ways that they can improve uh, their land to allow for more units. And I think that what we miss when in a lot of this is the more restrictions that we create, the harder it becomes for the smaller developers to even play in the sandbox. And so what's left are only very, very large developers who have the capital to come into Durham and actually develop. And something like Expanding Housing Choice opens that up. It allows more local development, and I believe we will have a better product and better partners in that work, which is another reason that I'm uh, supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> Council Member Reese, I guess you're the last person in the... Who, me? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one of the great things uh, about going last is that everything's been said, but not everybody's had a chance to say it. Um, and so I'm gonna try to avoid that tonight uh, by saying, first of all, I wanna thank everyone who um, stuck with us tonight until almost uh, midnight um, on a Tuesday night. Uh, it's a testament to the passion that people have for our city and how we decide to grow, uh, that, that folks uh, care that much about uh, what I think most people would agree is a fairly arcane set of uh, text amendments uh, to the UDO if the UDO weren't already arcane enough. Um, I also wanna say that I can't make a case for expanding housing choices any better than uh, Mayor Steve Shule did just a little bit ago, and so I'm not gonna try. Uh, I intend to support the measure tonight uh, for all the reasons that he said, along with Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member Alston, Council Member Caballero. Um, but I, what I wanna spend my time um, lifting up are, were the um, more cautionary remarks uh, made by uh, Council Member Middleton and Council Member Freeman. Um, I think, uh, I, their call to action tells us that tonight's vote has to be the beginning of this process. It cannot be the end. Uh, I take from their remarks that the passage of this item in places upon this city and this city council a special obligation to make sure that we do it right, that we find a way to cut the check Councilmember Middleton, that we find a way uh, to encourage landlords to accept um, housing choice vouchers um, and not to discriminate uh, on payment methods, that we find ways uh, to connect uh, low-income property owners with the financing they need to make use of these amendments. But I think right now, today, we have um, many friends in the community of developers that work on affordable housing, that build affordable housing who have told us without the passage of these amendments, we can't do as much good work in the community as we want to do. And um, while the bulk of expanding housing choices will uh, operate in the manner that the mayor said, I do wanna just also lift up those folks who came to us tonight and said uh, that they want to be able to continue to uh, produce um, small projects that are affordable uh, for folks and I think that's also worth lifting up. But mostly I just wanna say um, that, that this, as I said, cannot be the end of our process. We have to remain focused, we have to be vigilant. I love the fact that uh, Council Member Milton wants to get reports every six months because I think that's exactly right. We need to know what the impacts of this are in the communities uh, that it will impact. 
And so um, for that reason and with the mindfulness and intention uh, that Councilmember Middleton and Councilmember Freeman, um, that their remarks suggest, I, I believe we have that obligation um, and we should live up to it. But I intend to vote yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Councilmember Reese. Are there any more comments by members of the council? I just want to say how much I appreciate serving with each of you on a night like this where we get such uh, thoughtful comments from everyone. Much appreciated. All righty. Uh, do I hear a motion to adopt the appropriate consistency statement as required per NCGS 168-383? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. So moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Will you please close the vote? And the motion passes six to one. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO? So, so moved. moved. Second. So moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes six one. And Madam Clerk, would you please, uh, I'm sorry, uh, no, we're not there yet. Uh, do we have a motion to adopt a resolution regarding the development and reporting of metrics for expanding housing choices? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second to adopt the resolution regarding the development and reporting of metrics for expanding housing choices. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe that is the last business to come before this body, and I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 1151.